the Escape Goat podcast. A podcast series featuring the discussion of many different topics, flaws and all, based on personal whims and fascinations. Hosted by me, David Blake Fagiani, and several different guests. David Blake Fajani and welcome to the Escape Bit Podcast, a podcast about pretty much anything I want to talk about from week to week. Um, today I'm here with my friend Isabel McNally. Hi. Uh, and we're here to talk um, largely about Star Trek Voyager and more broadly about the Star Trek franchise as a whole, uh, some of the sort of recent uh, things in the franchise, recent works in the franchise and our kind of relationship with Star Trek, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a fandom, as a... As a sort of canon and kind of uh, where we where we're at with it these days, um, uh, Isabel is a friend of mine from high school. I uh, went to high school together, and I've known her for many years. And uh, when I first met her, when we were teenagers, we actually one of the first things we ever talked about was bonding over Star Trek. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. One of our earliest bonding experiences, I think, was Star Trek based. Yeah, and from the moment I knew I wanted to talk about this, I I, I thought you'd be the ideal person to sort of you know talk through the, the some of the things with. Um, would you like to tell me, uh, first of all, kind of a little bit about your personal relationship with Star Trek and how you came to it in the first place? Yeah, so uh, Star Trek has just always been there for me. I think our generation that sort of grew up in Star Trek households always had it about. So the Star Trek that's closest to my heart is uh, Next Generation. Picard will always be my captain. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it was always about... And then the earliest Star Treks that I actually remember beginning i don't remember when deep space nine started but i remember when voyager started i remember it being a tiny little child i would have been about seven or something when voyager started um and yeah i remember it being a big deal there's a new star trek coming out and mm. there's a female captain as well and that was probably one of my earliest memories of a tv event really mm-hmm so do you remember, were you, I suppose in, in the UK growing up, we would have probably got the first Voyager episodes in about 96, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Probably most, mostly on video to start with. Um, was it on BBC Two? I th I'm not sure. Exactly. I know uh, BBC Two sort of picked up most of the Star Trek series in the UK, didn't it? You know, it tended to play, it started to play The Next Generation, at least in the early 90s. Yeah. Um, you forget how long programmes took to filter through from the States in those yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. I think it went, Voyager went up pretty close to... The, the sort of original edit in the US but I think uh, some of my earliest experiences were the, were the rentals at Blockbusters yeah, yeah. my specific memory um, from Star Trek Voyager coming out was my auntie coming round and saying um, my mum said to her oh are you going to watch this new Star Trek that's coming out and my auntie goes oh no I'm not, I'm not into a female captain oh right which yeah. is I mean I, as a little child here we had very little idea of sort of gender inequality and stuff mm -hmm. that was my first experience of it going wait what yes. <laughs> yeah, just bizarre the first experience with reactionary fandom yeah exactly um I'm, I'm, but in my head that conversation was about it being on telly i see yeah, yeah. um no I, we weren't a um a blockbuster family we didn't rent mm. videos or anything like that if it was on telly we'd watch it if not it was just none of our business <laughs> did you have much experience with the original series um because my first the first way i came to star trek was my dad had quite a few videos lying around the house some of them bought some of them recorded off tv of the original series and i think that was before we even started to watch the next generation so i think at quite an early age probably mm. like amongst the first sort of you know quote unquote adult drama i'd watched was star trek yeah um did you have a similar thing of or was it, did you basically start with The Next Generation? I started with The Next Generation, yeah. And then I sort of retroactively got into the original series mm. just to, in my, my own little mind to be a bit of a completionist and know where, what, know where this entire thing that I was into would come from. Um, and I didn't get as into it. I mean, it's the original series is so massively different to modern era Star Trek, isn't it? In the way that it looks, the way that it's written it's you know the original series is a lot more sort of melodramatic and mm, mm. there's a this kind of like there's a more sort of severe kind of aspect to next generation onwards it's it's quite very it's quite serious yeah it's quite underplayed isn't it compared to the original series i, I was I, I was talking to um 
someone a few, a few years ago about the original series sort of aesthetically and they were saying that one of the things I, I think enjoyed about it as a kid was you know in retrospect was it's it's kind of almost like my first drama there's loads yeah. of primary colours there's loads of massively overdone music cues there's yeah. quite a lot of theatrical hammy over the top acting and oh, obviously there's there's a lot of kind of um, both humanoid and non-humanoid monsters in it yeah. it's, it's got more of a sort of exotic menagerie feel to it and but also it's just it, it's a great way to get into understanding drama because you know uh, Kirk and Spock and, and McCoy will be gathered around something will happen and there'll be a massive music thing that lets you know exactly yeah. what to think while they all look at each other yeah exactly so that, so you don't miss anything you know it's uh, and then you know the subtlety can hopefully come after that yeah <laughs> yeah it's, it's and, the, and the monsters are the are all these kind of humans in costume kind of thing that you know there's it was in the area of very few special effects so I mean the likes of the Gorn the Gorn. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> <laughs> we have discussed the Gorn at length before. And well, I love him, but some of my some of my favourite episodes of the original series, and again I'd watched these on video over and over again before I came to much of the sort of, you know, nineties franchise was uh there's the episodes like the one where they, they confront the sort of vampire cloud. Yeah. Uh, there's the giant amoeba one. Oh god, yeah. Uh, there's like, you know, things like the the um I can't remember what it's called, the uh the the Tholian web where you have these like very non humanoid kind of aliens portrayed via sort of like cutting edge 60s effects yeah uh, things that are kind of intangible but they're just out there in space and yeah there's a bit there's a bit of kind of experimental attitude towards the monsters in the original series i think it's, it's interesting actually because i think we'll, we'll, we'll get to talk about voyager shortly in, in slightly more depth but I, I think voyager in certain ways tries to replicate that sort of shock of the new and the exotic that the original mm. series has but it can never quite go that far again you know because because like the original series really is, is does feel like a zoo at times of you know a, a sort of frontier yeah uh, absolutely you know exploration and cataloging of these like crazy monsters from golden age sci-fi and you know kind of anything that was permeating the consciousness at the time yeah i do think one of the ways that voyager worked was because they were shunted into the delta quadrant they could have anything they wanted there whereas with um your original series and next generation everything in the alpha quadrant they'd done a lot of the exploring they'd found a lot of what was there you mm. couldn't have these enormous upsets with new completely bizarre life forms cause mm. why wouldn't we have seen them before so voyager did have a huge opportunity to find some pretty mad stuff out there yeah there's a sense in which a lot of the next generation is kind of um you know in in the late 80s when it started it's coming to fandom and sort of um almost like collating all the fandom that come before and creating a more fleshed out universe it's sort of um yeah. it's it's rounding out the the world isn't it and the sort of geopolit you know i can't say geopolitical but sort of gal galactopolitical <laughs> situation yeah. um i mean it's, it's actually notable that one of the season two episodes of tng that's most well known is q who which is the one mm. where they first account the borg and in order to not just not just meet the borg themselves but it, to give that that sense of like new exotic threat they actually do have to fling them halfway across the galaxy in that sense it's a yeah. bit of a preview of voyager yeah 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 i think there's a lot that voyager it being sort of this new take on star trek it it wants to go further and do new things but it's also very self-referential mm. in terms of where it sits within the entire franchise because mm -hmm. it does follow the the q storylines you know it does it still does keep itself quite neatly stitched mm. into star trek i should i should probably declare an interest in the way that you do at the start of uh, you know legal proceedings <laughs> the fact that my so, so i mean i mean they've all they've all to an extent been my star trek you know it's yeah. a, a really big franchise for me and it was definitely you know one from childhood that i still sort of take pleasure in and still love analyzing to death but the way it worked for me is obviously t started with the tos videos and sort of the, i guess like bonding with my dad primarily over tos the entire family got into next generation and i loved that and you know that was i definitely bonded equally with my dad my mom and my, my brother matt about that um and, and and i had the kind of like proto-adolescent experience of finding star trek deep space nine um and that kind of becoming a, again in quite a teenage way or pre-teenage way kind of my star trek mm -hmm. so deep space nine meant quite a lot to me and it already did by the time voyager came along yeah and i've always had a little bit of a and i mean like you know from about 95 onwards i've always had a little bit of a childish kind of deep space nine versus voyager yeah into fandom tribalism yeah i mean I, well i'm controversially not a huge fan of deep space nine mm. I, mm. there's a lot to like about it i'm not slagging it off or anything but when we talk about what my star trek is 
it's exploration it's getting about it's going mm. and having a look at things and deep space nine it's a space station it's sitting there the exploration is coming to them mm. um so it's that's why deep space nine never appealed to me as much as the other series in the, mm. the franchise there's a lot to like about it and a lot of the um the depth that they go into in deep space nine about the relationships between different species and all the politics of the alpha quadrant um is all really interesting stuff but on a sort of day-to-day watchability mm. i i don't know there's something i like about the travel aspect mm. of it well of course i mean i mean deep space nine was never as static as you know critics say even before they brought the defiant mm-hmm. on and stuff you know it was all i mean it starts with the premise that you can get to the gamma quadrant you know, yeah. which is 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 this new frontier idea and in that sense not that different from the sort of foundational you know expansion of voyager yeah. but i was re-watching quite a lot of deep space nine over the last few years especially on netflix you know yeah and i was realizing that um by the end of season two of deep space nine you know they introduced the dominion and and what you know part you know and obviously that leads to loads of great stuff loads of again like galactopolitical conflict you yeah. know the, the world feels somewhat more lived in the dominion themselves are really fascinating you know the, their interaction with the alpha quadrant powers is interesting but one thing it does do is it, it completely hems in the gamma quadrant yeah. it basically says well the dominion almost acts as that force within the show you cannot go any further now that 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 yeah. portion of the show is essentially over Mm-hmm. And, and 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 after that it's the enroaching threat isn't it you know it's it's the gamma quadrant is nowhere it's no longer anything to be explored or um yeah. you know traversed through it's just it's just it's just the threat is coming now and the and yeah. the, like pretty much the whole final sort of you know five four se- seasons of the show really are about that you know mm. the, that's that sense of exploration is shut off and after that episodes of um not just like physical exploration but sort of scientific exploration deep space nine it, that's that's not where it's going that's not yeah. what it's focusing so i completely yeah. understand that the, Voyager has a lot more in common with the lineage of the original series and, and aspects of the next generation. Yeah. And Voyager for me as a kid was completely terrifying in its premise because I was seven or something when it came mm. out. The first episode happens and they get flung further than anyone's ever been and it's going to take them 70 years or something to get back. And for me as a little kid, I was watching it thinking, they're never going to see their mummies and daddies again. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is this is so scary. Yeah, the, the sort of primal fear of losing home. Yeah. yeah, it was like being lost in the supermarket on an enormous <laughs> yes. intergalactic scale. Um, so yeah, that was brand new and really took what I liked about Star Trek, the exploration, to an extreme because this was like non-consensual exploration. They didn't want to go and yes. <laughs> explore that bit. It's like, yes, they, they did go out to see new things, but not that much. Yes, not it, like it, that. The sense of sort of traumatised reluctance runs yeah. through Voyager, doesn't it? You know, they're not, they're not, I mean, they are, you know, generally sort of conventionally portrayed as heroic Starfleet officers yeah. in theory, but in practice they are, they do not want to be there. In yeah. fact, they want to get home as soon as possible. Yeah, I think that affected my relationship with Janeway as well. Um, because she did get on my nerves a lot. Um, she she didn't have the sense of urgency that I had about getting that crew home. <laughs> she promised them in the first episode, we're going to do everything in our power to get you home. And then three episodes later, she'll be like, oh, what's that over there? It's like, Let's go and have a look. Let's go and have a look. <laughs> I suppose it's that, um, you know, I think we'll talk a lot more about Janeway, but I think the the general sort of Star Trek, uh, you know, to, to the extent that Star Trek is a utopian scientific mm. exploration show, like stitching that to a premise of, you know, urgent mission completion, it's yeah. always going to throw up contradictions, isn't it? You know? Yeah, of course. And I think the way that Voyager started was with that moral dilemma mm. of what to do about the array and the caretaker and stuff. So there was, there's always that balance of... How do we prioritise completing our mission mm-hmm. against all of these kind of moral considerations that they have to take on as a crew? And it's kind of convenient that everyone kind of seems to get behind Janeway a lot and not one member of that crew just loses their mind about the fact that we're not doing everything we have to do. Everyone's a bit of a united front which is very convenient for Janeway when she's going off to have a look in some hole on an asteroid because there might be something nice in there. I'm very glad you brought that up because I, I think I'll, I'll, I was thinking about ways to approach this discussion and I think one of the ways that I'll start off is I'll start off by throwing a few things 
at you as kind of kind of as the the, the case for the prosecution okay. towards Voyager. And you, know, you, know, you, you can agree with some of it as well. That's fine yeah, too. Yeah, of course. Um, but you might have some counter takes on it as well. You yeah. know. But I'll just I suppose what I'll be I'll be the voice for the the ordinary Deep Space Nine fan mm-hmm. who just has some obvious things to say about Voyager. <laughs> and I think you've just you've just started you've just touched on some of them there. Um, Voyager has, you know, Voyager starts by fleeing two ships, Voyager, the Starfleet mm-hmm. ship, and the uh, Marquis the ship, captured by Chakotay, into the Delta Quadrant, and within the first episode, they're, they're both, the Marquis ship is destroyed, and both crews are flung together, mm-hmm. so the basic premise is you've got these two um, disparate groups of individuals with differing political philosophies, different yeah. um, ideas of discipline and command, um, priorities, and they have to coexist on the show. Uh, well, presumably that is the show. You know, mm-hmm. at the beginning you think, oh, okay, this is good. this is going to be the show. This will be this. It, it's it's pretty clear to me mm. that Voyager quite quickly doesn't know what to do with that. Yeah, as there. a show, Voyager doesn't know where it wants to take that conflict between the Voyager way of life and the Maquis way of life. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it is one of the things that I think is again quite convenient that. Janeway appoints Chakotay as her second in command and the Marquis just kind of go alright cool, we're Starfleet now and the Marquis are kind of an I would see them as this sort of like anarchist organisation mm. and the, the fact that they're all very willing to go okay what's my what's my role how can I serve Starfleet mm-hmm. and there's no sort of bitterness about how Starfleet hasn't helped the Marquis in their previous <laughs> endeavours like you know mm. they've got this very strong sense of principle about what they were trying to achieve mm. before all of this happened to them and it kind of just fizzles out and there are a few episodes in which it comes back to the surface a little bit there's uh, there is an episode where Tuvok uh, takes a few of them under his wing and oh yeah quite early on but a learning curve I think that's yeah cool. yeah um it's the then, idea of them as sort of a problem set of, of yeah. staff that are to be integrated in, into the business. Yeah, so. exactly. And of all people to appoint to that. I mean, I, I, I think <laughs> someone with a very acute sense of empathy who can really talk and understand, but they, they put the most matter-of-fact man in charge of it to just smashing them into this Starfleet, Starfleet mould. Yeah, well, also the, uh, the 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 man who's revealed to be a traitor in their myths in the first episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Rubbing he, their faces in it a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I think one of the things... I was thinking a bit about the sort of um, failure of uh, Voyager to do much with the sort of Mackey plotline. And it does it does stuff. I'm not, I'm not saying it... You know, with all of this, there's all the stuff I'm accusing Voyager of, like, of, of, you know, having half-developed or abandoned plot lines it, it does treat them you know they, yeah. i'm not saying it ignores them after the first episode it doesn't it, it does less with them than i would like and mm-hmm. some of that's just down to the sort of limitations of uh you know 90s especially like pre pre joss whedon you know sort of yeah. tv there's all that one of the things i was thinking about the maquis is that they are like in 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 tng and uh deep space nine the maquis are fairly well defined because they they are in an area of the galaxy where their conflict and the urgency of their conflict makes sense mm. the problem is when you get when, when the whole premise is you're fleeing to the, the other side of the galaxy, everything that makes the Maki distinct from yeah. orthodox Starfleet kind of disappears, and in a sense you can make that the point. Yeah. But it feels like it's diffused too quickly. Like, what real differences are they going to have with Starfleet when it's not about fighting the Cardassian border insurgency? Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, there's a, I, I do agree. There's a lot more that they could have done with it, and I think they didn't know what they wanted to do with it when they when they started down that route i mean it's a good premise but they didn't do a lot in the first episode and then when you get further down the line and you just find out yeah that whole mckay mckay thing is over you know they get the transmission that says everyone's dead Mm. (laughs) and that's kind of convenient because that means that problem isn't going to come back come up when we get back to the alpha quadrant Mm. and that i I feel like the way that they kind of handled that and when they handled it, it was at a point in the series where they're getting, you know, they've shaved a lot of years off their their journey home. They're getting mm-hmm. transmissions come through, so you know they're within touching distance of getting home. And I feel like they just couldn't be bothered handling mm-hmm. whether the likes of Chakotay and Balana are going to go 
back to earth or they're gonna go carry on fighting their their battles i suppose there's no real alternative so that's that's the that's kind of the problem with the maki is you know as a problem of integration is that you know in the early seasons you have uh you know this out uh, there eventually they reveal that seska is yeah you know a maki crew member who's less happy with the status quo and thus she starts she goes leaves the ship that starts working with the k's on and becomes yeah. sort of a um a slightly cheesy uh, pantomime villain figure yeah but but even even her presence once she's left the ship is slightly stretching credulity isn't it even within star trek where credulity is quite loose <laughs> yeah. um because really if these crew members you know in the, those early episodes they sometimes deal with the idea of like what if the crew wants to mutiny or leave or you know or peacefully leave the ship on mass yeah well it's like well well what would happen then is they just would leave and we would never see them again yeah exactly they could just could yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we'd never know. You know, it would never have more impact on the show. So yeah. it's kind of, I think, I think to an extent, you run up against the limits of the possible. Yeah. In terms of nice television, at least. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot they could have done with it, but I'm, I'm not that resentful that they didn't. Mm-hmm. I kind of, I kind of just take that as part of it because you can't, like you said, you can't resolve those conflicts. People either leave or kill each other, or, mm-hmm. and then we've just got fewer crew members on Voyager there's not there's not any kind of grand resolution to it and I think the narrative of us just trying to get back home is stronger than having this infighting and I, I ha- find in Voyager quite frustrating to watch because I'm desperate for this ship to get home as a mm. little kid it would have been even more frustrating if everyone was squabbling mm. at the same time so I kind of get why they diffused the, those tensions mm-hmm. uh, quite early on but it makes sense for the narrative but maybe it just doesn't make sense on a human mm-hmm. level to how people would actually behave in those circumstances did you say you were about seven when you started watching Voyager? yeah did you so, so that means obviously it wrapped up when you were about about 14 i guess yeah that's quite a long time isn't it into yeah his life. Did, those you, are quite like formative yeah. years of your <laughs> life as well did you did you remain uh engaged like like you know an engaged fan of voyager all the way up to the end yeah yeah i mean yeah. it was on it was it was definitely on bbc2 i think maybe sunday nights i think it was mm-hmm. um deep space nine then voyager mm-hmm. sort of double bill um yeah so i did definitely watched it all the way through because unlike me because it because because voyager voyager for me it, it has this kind of dubious honor of being the star trek show that i think i can that basically that i fell out of love with yeah because i i watched voyager i mean i've since seen later episodes but i i essentially watched voyager up to about the end of season five which is you know in the seven mm. seasons it's not it's not like i bailed early on yeah but i was realizing again through netflix rewatching how how many gaps there are after that because the kind yeah. of the, the last sort of the last big thing in voyager i remember is the, the equinox plot line where they mm. had the other starfleet ship you know um at the end of season five and beginning of season six and um part of that was me was me getting a bit older and part of it was me sort of um moving on because I'd, I'd watched i'd watched the end of ds9 and yeah. that's roughly at the, the end of ds9 so i think i think at the stage I was at finishing DS9 felt like the end of business with with Star Trek for yeah me. and I think the part of that is just because I'd lost any feeling of urgency or identification with with Voyager's joint journey home you know yeah. I, I didn't really feel like you know although in, in a sense it is going somewhere I didn't really feel like it was going anywhere interesting at that stage yeah I think the the momentum of the show dies off I mean you get to around season five where, and that that's when we we know we're, we're getting home like you know a few years left but like, we'll we'll do it and just it gets inane <laughs> <laughs> the show gets inane and it's there's so many episodes right this is gonna happen now i'm gonna slag off the holodeck okay good okay good. so yeah dave you have heard me slag the holodeck I off many have, times yeah. Yeah. but what i really can't do with in voyager and it's part of this sense of urgency that i have about getting the ship home they spend so much time on the holodeck which i think must be a huge drain on energy everyone's got replicator rations and things like that we're all making sure that we have enough energy to keep the ship going they go on dangerous missions to mine deuterium or whatever it is Mm, that sounds like a thing yeah yeah that sounds right doesn't it plausible yeah yeah (laughs) so they do that because they need to keep the ship going but tom and balana are going to Italy skiing every weekend on the holodeck. There's so many episodes that are purely about the holodeck. Mm. Maybe spend less time on the holodeck. There's, there's there's a strange amount of holodeck use in um 
in Voyager, isn't it? Because somewhere like DS Nine, you you kind of you hear a lot of talk about the whole suites, but they're usually just sort of joke about how how sleazy Quark's bar is. Oh god, yeah, of course. Um, whereas actually, Voyager, you you probably get like more holographically generated environments as kind yeah. of running sites of interest that in, in a, than in any of the other shows. And obviously, I'll talk a bit about you know, some of the, the the more interesting characters a bit, but you you get the Doctor. Yeah. Um, it, it's quite. I I actually think that one of the more interesting things that Voyager gives not 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 gives the Star Trek universe but fleshes out yeah. in the same way that DS9 fleshes out um the Ferengi for example mm. uh Voyager s- at least starts to or no, does quite a lot of work to fleshing out holographic life yeah and where that can go however it also does a lot of pretty silly stuff with it yeah I mean and that's where I mean that it gets inane and um, the Doctor is one of my favourite characters. I respect him as an individual, and I think he has all the rights of any other member of that crew. Um, but I don't think we need to have two holodecks running at all times. I see. And also, everyone's on replicator rations. Even if the engineering have done a wonderful job to make the holodeck as energy efficient as possible, all the ridiculous costumes that they wear to play on the holodeck, they're all replicated. Mm-hmm. There's not no one's just sewing them together in one of the hydroponics bays. There, they so it's just a ridiculous amount of energy that is being wasted on the holodeck. And I would have a word if I were a member of that crew. <laughs> I, I do quite fancy uh, hanging out at Sandrine's, the, uh, the, pool, the pool bar. That looks <laughs> yeah, quite good. Yeah, I like that. That was quite good. I'm not so sure about Leonardo da Vinci's workshop. Uh, that was uh, that was insane. <laughs> I was watching it? a few of those. Yeah, I, the, one of my favourite aspects of the holodeck, though, is is it what's Tom and Harry's program, Captain Proton? Oh, Captain Proton, yeah. I mean, that's just adorable, isn't it? <laughs> Essentially, I love that they call these things like holo novels. When you just play in, you're playing dress up, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. You're going to play. It's not. This isn't. It's very overtly childish, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love the fact that they will go and play Captain Proton, and then there'll be a red alert, and they have to report to the bridge in their dress up costumes and there's no sense of shame about that I mean that's a truly futuristic utopia when you don't have to feel ashamed of, about dressing up and going to play at work <laughs> it really is yeah that's one of the more utopian successful <laughs> utopian aspects of it I'd agree um, I think um, I think Voyager you know it, it, do, it does successfully I, I think I think sometimes more by accident than design uh, just because it's going in so many crazy directions especially in the mm. later seasons it does manage to develop uh, certain things in the Star Trek universe that are underdeveloped elsewhere uh, and you know even when it's not the kind of things that I really wanted out of Voyager back in the yeah. day and um, one thing I was going to ask you about is um, Voyager sometimes and I, I don't share so much in this criticism but like Voyager sometimes gets accused of not really contributing memorable new alien species to the franchise mm. and obviously over relying on the Borg yeah. from about the midpoint onwards which I think yeah. I think that bit that aspect's true yes, and I don't I, think it really adds anything good to the Borg I, I would I would argue yeah but um do you think do you think there are memorable alien species additions to the franchise from Voyager uh species 8472 they're pretty good yeah, yeah. I mean because they were they were genuinely scary if you grew up with TNG and the Borg are the scariest thing in the universe and then you find this species that the Borg are scared of mm, mm. I mean that that changes things I think it depends on what your relationship with Star Trek and with Voyager is there's a sense that I think once we've had enough run-ins with the Borg and Species 8472 to come in the Borg sort of power gets a little bit diminished mm, mm. and we and we enjoyed being scared of the Borg so when they get less scary if your if your relationship with Voyager as a show isn't strong, there's a little bit of a. I don't think I gave you permission to ruin one of the scariest species in Star Trek. <laughs> I think the problem with Species Eight Four Seven Two is that the um, after their introduction in the mm. Scorpions two parter, they're only used a, a couple more times, and yeah. one of them is a kind of alien versus predator rip off with the Herogen. Oh, of course, yeah. You know, with one isolated member of the species, and another one's that kind of slightly bizarre one where they're surveying the Federation from a sort of simulated Starfleet Academy. Yeah. The problem is after that they they kind of dissipate, and I think part of that's because you've set them up to be so. Um, militaristically powerful. Yeah. That it, I mean, uh, things like the Borg existing. Uh, I know they're meant to be based in the Delta Quadrant, but things like the Borg existing in the galaxy mm. without everyone in the galaxy being terrified is already stretching plausibility a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So if you introduce something that's more powerful and is you know, as you know, like more genocidal, 
yeah and they're just suddenly the new threat in the galaxy that that that's that would almost be series um defining wouldn't it yeah that would that would almost turn voyager into that it would be voyager's equivalent of the dominion it would be voyager's yeah. we, almost like we can still go home but we're basically going home to warn people now yeah we have to retreat and get back to tell people that these horrendous beings are on the horizon but i think with the thing with bc 472 when they sort of disappear it is kind of after that episode where they're in human form mm. surveying the federation and at that point obviously in human form they've been humanized and then they're quite reasonable when they get when we get to speak to them i remember them being very nice yeah they i mean they they felt threatened and they they there's that whole theme in the early series where voyager's getting a really bad rep in the <laughs> delta quadrant because a lot of their actions may come off as a bit militaristic or mm. and no one around there has ever seen anyone with like this kind of ship and these kind of people and that kind of mission before mm. And so, I suppose the moment you can negotiate with them, they're they're instantly more defanged than the Borg, aren't they? Because yeah. however much they dilute the Borg or just overexpose them, they are they do basically remain unnegotiable with. I mean, yeah. even the Scorpions, you know, it's it's revealed like the moment they don't need the Federation anymore, they're they're right back on the assimilation drive. And, yeah, you know, the, 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 I think I, of all the things Voyager does wrong, I don't think it, I don't think it defangs the Borg in that sense. They're still implacable. Yeah, exactly. You know? I, you've always got to keep an eye on the Borg. I mean, it's quite, I don't have a problem with that whole alliance with the Borg, um, even though I do I do like the Borg to be on this kind of top level of scary guys mm-hmm. in the universe. Of course, yeah. Um, that um, analogy that Chakotay gives in that episode about the scorpion and mm-hmm. how they, the scorpion... Is it a fox? A scorpion riding on a fox across a river? Yeah, something like and that. And the... Yeah. The scorpion stings the fox halfway through, and the fox is like, "What? What the hell do you do that for?" Now we're both gonna die. And the scorpion's like, mm, "Well, I'm a scorpion." That analogy it always sort of stuck with me, and it, I would have only been little when I first heard it. Mm. Um, one of the best Chicote moments. As it well. is one of the best Chicote moments, and not one where he's claiming it's part of his Native American yeah, ancestry. Yeah, I know. Yeah, his <laughs> pseudo Native American. <laughs> heritage i told you I, 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 I certainly think it's incontestable that one of the stronger characters we'll be, we'll be discussing is not chakotay <laughs> but i told you about this uh, i think i told you about this didn't i the um the, the uh i read this a few years ago that the voyager as as you know was was very much the done thing by the mid 90s it it it, it tried to do the work it, it mm. hired a native american cultural consultant when they came up with the character of chakotay to advise the show yeah um i'll link to this in the show notes because there was, there was an expose article about this, but it turned out um, a, a few, I think, a few years into the show, that this guy was a complete fraud. He yeah, had no he had background. no background in Native American history whatsoever. Not at all. Didn't even know much about it. Made a lot up. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't even that he just he just stole another knowledge. It was just, just made a lot up. <laughs> and he did advise. It wasn't just Voyager. He did advise many other shows, like going right back into eighties television. And uh, I think some of the what on earth do we do with Chicote stuff in the later series comes mm. from the fact that well they've already done this and now they're very embarrassed about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Chakotay is an uncomfortable character in that respect, because even if they had got a proper Native American consultant, part of the premise of the whole Star Trek franchise is that we're all cool now on Earth. Mm-hmm. It's utopian on Earth. Mm-hmm. Which me, If we're going to have an oppressed people, such as the Native Americans you're assuming that they're all okay <laughs> yes with yeah. everything that's happened to them as a species as a species as a race <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i think it's it's a little bit uncomfortable to have someone who is very much characterized as connected to his native american roots within this utopian society where everyone's fine now i suppose some of that's the vagueness of um how much people within the federation retain distinctive earth cultural markers that we recognize yeah you know, like, i mean there's a, there's a few there's a few sort of acknowledgements i, I think that, isn't it famous in the next generation they, they have one episode where they mention like diwali is happening that oh week. yeah and it's kind of it's just a thing data notes in a sort of log entry yeah. but, but in terms of actual you know real world religious like ethno religious mm. kind of markers Star Trek just prefers to draw a veil over that, really, because yeah. it's too much of a can of worms, isn't it? You know, it, one of DS9's big sort of contributions to the franchise is they have the Bajorans who kind of stand for all religion, really. Yeah. You know, yeah, they're, they're like the it kind of whitewashes religion. religion with the Bajorans. Yeah. That's them. Yeah. If you want to talk yeah. about religions, you do a Bajoran. 
yeah. thing. You know, there, there's no such thing as like a like a, a very a, 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 a willing to stand corrected. But I don't think there's any like strongly Christian or strongly Hindu no. characters in Star Trek. It's certainly not where it would become an issue or, no, or no. something to talk about. But yeah, they do try and write a lot of cultural practice in Star Trek. Like he'll go on a vision quest and stuff like that. Um, so that I mean, that's a religious practice, isn't it? But yeah. They, they go into it in a practical level in that this is what Chakotay will do because he needs to go and figure this out. Mm-hmm. But in terms of his belief and how he's connected to his culture and how he feels about it and how other people from his tribe would feel about it on mm. a wider level, there's not any kind of detailed discussion with that. Mm. I mean, it's one of the, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it would help if we had some Native American background to talk about this with us, but yeah. I think that everything about Chicote, especially the early depiction of him in the show, it, it's one of those examples of like nineties TV uh, aging badly, not through bad intentions, mm. just through just through inevitable um, kind of aesthetic cheesiness. You know, yeah. I mean, like you know, whenever Chicote is talking about one of his vision quests, you'll, you'll literally have pan pipes in the soundtrack in the background. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's not it's not treating it on a level. It's kind of it's 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 exoticizing it, and yeah. maybe there wasn't another way to do that in the mid nineties. Although yeah. obviously an authentic consultant may have helped. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, he's certainly not one of the stronger characters. I, I think. Um, would you like to? In a little bit, we'll we'll go into discussion of some of the sort of stronger episodes and sort of mm. you know arcs in Voyager. Um, would you like to talk briefly about who you think the strongest characters on the show are? Uh, yeah, I think. I love the Doctor. The Doctor's. He's always been my favourite. We're just watching him grow as a person. I I think I enjoy the characters that do get that kind of personal growth, and he's was in the entire seven series and watching him go from a stroppy little hologram into quite a sensitive and self-aware human i really enjoyed that about him and he does have some really good episodes um and i think they they did use him to go into a lot of the moral and ethical things about who he is as a person is he a person like that kind of sci-fi debate over individuality when it comes to mm. um artificial life forms well in the way he's uh i mean you know in the first uh, two series ish you know he's essentially uh, partly through necessity obviously but he's, he's essentially confined to one room yeah yeah for, for most of the episodes and you know he th- there's definitely a bit of a disparity between the way the rest of the crew is treated and the way he is isn't he? i mean he's turned off yeah. Uh, by people when they leave the room, you know, you get people people do that just to shut him up at times. And yeah, it's, kind of it's quite for, rude. It's played for comic <laughs> effect a lot of the time. Yeah, but but you know, they, 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 obviously he actually has to fight back against that, and they don't do it heavy handedly. But you know, he that does become unacceptable behaviour yeah. as the show goes on. He's he's quite an inspirational character though, in the way that he is very much a minority in terms of who he is on that crew, and he really has to stick up for his rights a lot, and you know, he has to fight for the mobile emitter so that he can go about. Um, he you know he sort of asks people to treat him in the way that he would like to be treated and mm. i just think as individuals especially any kind anyone individual with a kind of shyness or mm. <laughs> you know if you're kind of a passive person he's quite a, an inspirational character in that he sort of makes his mark in his own way mm. And he's he's always writing new subroutines and stuff for himself. He's he's into his own self improvement. Yes. And he's he's quite an understated character, but he he really puts a lot of work into his own personal development mm. and sort of projecting an idea of himself that which is who he wants to be. Mm. And I think the way you talk about him, you know, sort of kind of uh, being a receptacle for ideas about minority rights and stuff. Mm. I suppose although he's played by a you know a, a white middle aged man. Yeah. He is, he's kind of, because holo- we don't actually have sentient holograms, he's able to be a kind of every minority in a sense, isn't yeah. he? He's able to be like, like like in the same way the Bajorans are, every religion. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of, he's kind of he's dealing with He's the most, marginalised group. Yeah. Most, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not I'm not saying he can express all those things, obviously, yeah. but he, he's able to sign for fairly generic minority rights in, yeah. in any given situation. Yeah. Do you think there's any other characters that stand out to you as being favourites on Voyager? You know, either at a particular phase of the show or across um, it? I think Seven of Nine is obviously, I think everyone would agree with this, Mm. is an exceptional character because she's terrifying because she's Borg, but she's also adorable. (laughs) She's essentially this, she stopped her sort of personal development when she was a little girl, when she was Annika Hansen getting assimilated. 
and then she... hor- which is a horrendous idea really isn't it yeah i mean there's a lot in voyager which is actually pretty full-on this terrified little six-year-old girl mm. in space with her parents. I suppose there's somewhere. elements of uh, Newton aliens yeah. there as well, you know, the yeah, sort of yeah. rehabilitation of a victim. Uh, you know, there's obviously, if you want to like, do franchise precedence, there's elements of data in there as yeah. well. Although she's she's recovering something that she had, not something she never had. Yeah, of course. Or something that she had nascently. You know. Yeah, yeah. so her individuality was blossoming at the time that she got assimilated by the Borg. And then years later she's trying she's learning how to be a human be an adult be an individual and there's something really cute and disarming about that she just doesn't know how to interact with people when she's trying to practice her social skills and she's just doing her very best to have social interactions Mm. and still being a bit bog about everything well and to let um let female actors uh on nice television and you know early noise television to be um because you know i mean let's let's address the elephant in the room jerry jerry ryan is gorgeous she's well hot yeah yes yeah, she's, yeah. she's i think we're both part of the jerry ryan fan club <laughs> um she's also very good actress uh very uh charming and i think a lot of the episodes especially as the show goes on let her be pretty goofy yeah yeah um, and there's the the we discussed this episode recently the episode where um she downloads the doctor into herself to hide him yes yes um and that is just a brilliant episode to showcase jerry ryan's acting ability because her impression of the doctor whilst the doctor's in her mm. is brilliant yeah, she gets all these Picardo. little little head tilts and smirks and she does an amazing job and it's just such a good opportunity to give an actress who can act really well this platform on which to show that when her actual character is quite rigid yeah and i don't think there's um you know from the next generation era onwards really you start getting kind of a slight well i'd say from deep space nine onwards really you start getting more um female character development you know people yeah. like kira and dax um especially um but i think you don't get many of those characters who have the opportunity to do much really comedic stuff if, if they are doing that comedic stuff it's kind of light-hearted it's quite you know yeah. it's maybe taking some of the more serious characters down a peg but seven's allowed to be kind of goofy in her own right yeah you know there are elements of her character which are quite silly and she's yeah. allowed to just portray that and have fun with it in the way that brent spiner did quite a lot on tng yeah. and, and as you say when she's impersonating the other actors as well and i think it's it, the two characters we've mentioned so far it's, it, it is apparent that those they're amongst the best actors on the show as well yeah. so there's, there's inevitably part of that yeah you know there's a lot of not to be mean about the other actors but there's a lot of members of the ensemble who don't really make much of an impact throughout the show and it's not because they're terrible actors they're just they're just kind of there's a neutrality to them they're not they're not the worst thing in the world but they're not standing out when you've got the likes of uh robert picardo and jerry ryan yeah acting next to them yeah and i think there's you know there's there's some actors on voyager who've gone on to um is is it um uh the actress who plays Bolana Torres, uh, uh, Roxanne Dawson, Roxanne Dawson, and the guy who played Tom Paris, uh, oh, yeah. Duncan McNeil, yeah, think. something like that. And they've both gone on to be successful television directors. Yeah, uh, after Roxanne a Dawson's written and directed and produced a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. and and, um, and McNeil started uh, doing directing on Voyager. Like you know, a lot of cast members get their uh, yeah. breaks starting in Star Trek directing, and then they move on to direct other stuff. And then they've both. <laughs> Again, without being mean, I think they've both recognised that their talents might not really be on screen. Yeah. And then and they've had very successful careers since then, and, and you know, good luck to them. Um, yeah. Do you think, um, apart from, I, I tell you what, let's 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 we've got already got the Doctor, and we've got Seven. Mm. Let's talk, but just before we break, um, let's talk a little bit about Janeway in general. Yeah. Because you say that one of the things that impressed you about the show, I suppose, it's a from a marketing sense, in a sense, was the the, the idea that there would be a female captain and this yeah. would be a big deal. Yeah, and it, in all honesty, now even many many years later, I'm not entirely sure how I feel about Janeway. I, I think it's it's there's a lot of good decisions that they made about how to go about having this female captain, um, and obviously speaking from a feminist perspective, I I think I do think she's handled in quite a quite a good way. They didn't make her getting home be about the fact that she has a husband and kids back home you know she's mm. um how old do you think she is in the show in her like late 30s early 40s I suppose, or she's, something? I suppose she's meant to be about about 40 would yeah you say? i would say around 40 it's this when you start watching things as kids you never have much idea yeah of how old it's just a grown-up you... yeah <laughs> i'd say she's probably meant to be yeah yeah maybe tail end of her 30s yeah, yeah. i mean just in terms of what her rank is in starfleet as well she's mm. had a long career as a science officer before she became captain of voyager and um 
so yeah she's she's lived a life she's lived her own life she's put a lot of time into a career she has a dog she has a dog as she see i think there's quite a lot of implication that she misses the dog more than she misses her partner yes yeah i think they're at least 50 50 talked about you know yeah yeah um but yeah she i mean she's a strong independent woman which you know for a little girl growing up is a brilliant thing to have on screen mm. um she despite the fact that she's not uh portrayed as a mother character she's not going back home for her kids um she is still very maternal mm. in the way that she looks after the crew and particularly harry kim she does have a maternal aspect with harry kim to begin with mm. and then with Kess and then with Seven as well. Oh, so very she's, much so, yeah. She's always got a child amongst the crew. I think I think the, 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 she's got a lot of son relationships with male members of the crew, hasn't mm. she? But I think she's also... I think the daughter relationships are the strongest on the show. Yeah. I think with Kess and more... Probably more successfully with Seven. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because she she sort of found Kess and brought her along. But with Seven, she kind of brought her into being. So that mother element of it, because she was the one that dragged her out of the collective, she mm. sort of birthed her in that way mm. and so took a great amount of responsibility of her development afterwards mm. uh, well i suppose there's a sense in that sense uh, you know c- coming roughly halfway through the show seven of nine's introduction and the way in which they introduce her and you write the, the the decisive role in which Gemma takes in, in reclaiming her mm. it's it's a bit like um almost like a refresher on the caretaker idea isn't it like the yeah. the idea that Janeway does a moral thing which has lasting consequences mm. it's almost more successful with seven specifically than it is with the general crew situation yeah or as as successful at least it's almost like a refresher of it yeah. Janeway does things that matter and then has to live with them. Yeah. You know. I think Janeway perhaps for me becomes more likable as the series goes on. Um maybe just because I don't know, she has a moment. She does some stuff. She does. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll talk about some of that in a second. <laughs> yeah. So before we move on to uh the discussion of more specific episodes and kind of what they uh what they bring to the table in Voyager, uh, you know, what the highlights of the show are perhaps. Uh, I'll play this uh this audio clip. Um, and then we'll be right back. See you soon. You were awfully quiet. I didn't want the others to hear this, but I think what you're proposing is too great a risk. How so? There's a story I heard as a child, a parable, and I never forgot it. A scorpion was walking along the bank of a river, wondering how to get to the other side. Suddenly, he saw a fox. He asked the fox to take him on his back across the river. The fox said, no. If I do that, you'll sting me, and I'll drown. The scorpion assured him, if I did that, we'd both drown. So the fox thought about it, finally agreed. So the scorpion climbed up on his back, and the fox began to swim. But halfway across the river, the scorpion stung him. As the poison filled his veins, the fox turned to the scorpion and said, why did you do that? Now you'll drown too. I couldn't help it, said the scorpion. It's my nature. I understand the risk. And I'm not proposing that we try to change the nature of the beast, but this is a unique situation. To our knowledge, the Borg have never been so threatened. They're vulnerable. I think we can take advantage of that. Even if we do somehow negotiate an exchange, how long will they keep up their end of the bargain? It could take months to get across Borg territory. We'd be facing thousands of systems, millions of vessels. But only one collective, and we've got them over a barrel. We don't need to give them a single bit of information, not until we're safe. We just need the courage to see this through to the end. There are other kinds of courage, like the courage to accept that there are some situations beyond your control. Not every problem has an immediate solution. You're suggesting we turn around? Yes. We should get out of harm's way. Let them fight it out. In the meantime, there's still plenty of Delta Quadrant left to explore. We may find another way home. Oh, we might find something else. Six months? A year down the road? After Species 8472 gets through with the Borg? We could find ourselves right back in the line to fire. And we'll have missed the window of opportunity that exists right here, right now. Okay, welcome back, uh, and we're going to be talking uh, a little bit more about Star Trek Voyager and uh, maybe more specifically about some of the episodes and plot lines and arcs uh, that occur across the show, maybe particular highlights for us. So, uh, Isabel, let's talk a little bit about kind of earlier Voyager. Um, what are your highlights of, should we say, the f- like roughly the first two series? 
Yeah, um, I'll try and remember where stuff fits in because the way that Voyager is with um, its inanity <laughs> is <laughs> that a lot of the episodes kind of sit alone um, and it's hard to place them within the mm. overall story arc because they're not really part of it. Yeah, and it remains, you know, it, it remains fairly episodic throughout. There's, yeah. some, there's some attempts at arcs. I, I tend to group the first two series together, the first two seasons together, but because they contain i mean pretty much all the kazon stuff yeah yeah um and the you know all the seska stuff yeah um and 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 that, and that kind of feels like there's it feels like a phase of early voyager where they're, they're trying to do certain things um we talked a bit about the maquis already you know yeah. mo- most of the really conflict heavy you know even the sort of um, potential of the maquis stuff is contained within those yeah. first two series we were talking a little bit about alien races in voyager and how distinctive they are one of the things that's also I don't think the K's on a much of a loss. I don't mm. think we probably need to go over them, them very much. But one of the things that's in the, the early part of Voyager quite heavily is the Vidians. Yeah. The Vidian um, phage is like a huge overarching theme mm. in, in early Voyager, I think. And it it's introduced quite early and it's quite gruesome. Mm. You know, the whole harvesting of organs and what the phage actually does to people. Mm. There's, I found earlier Voyager has this really strong body horror mm. theme that's d- not just with the th- phage with other stuff that happens um which sort of dies off as the series goes on i think it gives way to a more psychological horror mm-hmm. but there's this gruesome physicality to a lot of the things that they encounter in the first couple of series i think that's true and that, that i think the episode phage it is very early on it's in it's within the sort of first handful of maybe five yeah. or six episodes and that obviously features um the introduction of the Vidians in it, you have uh, Neelix getting his lungs stolen from him. Yeah, they just nick Neelix's lungs. And he had no business being on that away mission. <laughs> he did, he is the cook. <laughs> and he shouldn't even be the cook because everyone hates his cooking. Yeah, yeah. He has got no business on that ship. <laughs> yeah, we didn't... Um, I, I think I think Ethan Phillips, who plays Neelix, um, I don't think he, sh- he should share in the lambasting of the Neelix character. Uh, mm. But there is there are some problems with Neelix, and I think we'll probably touch on those, oh, maybe, yeah. maybe particularly in the early show, actually. Yeah. Because um, we'll talk about Kez a bit. Um, I think the Vidians are great, and I think I think with the Vidians, um, they're so resonant and they're so memorable and they're so yeah. terrifying and they're so, but they're also like humanized from n- not maybe not the nice elements of humanity, yeah. But they're so humanized and fleshed out from the start that you run into that thing about Voyager where for it to be semi believable, mm. they do actually have to leave spaces and uh, alien races and segments of the galaxy behind as they progress on the journey. Yeah, yeah. In some cases, that's probably for the best. In, yeah. In cases like the Vidians, it's probably not. Yeah. I think, well, the Vidians are kind of topical for us at the moment, aren't they? They sort of, they sh- they're, they've got this horrendous disease that's afflicting them and they're behaving horribly about it, going and stockpiling organs. Mm, mm. It's kind of a, really gruesome uh version of panic buying mm. where they just go off and steal people's organs that's true i suppose i suppose there's a, there's a sort of survival horror side to the videos as well where they're kind of um they're a little bit like one of the sort of um camps that you'd find in the walking dead or something you know, yeah they're, they're like a, they're, there's that sense of the delta quadrant as being i mean you could put all sorts of markers on it you know there's a kind of wild west feel to it i've seen mm. some critics say uh, i've seen other people say it's basically the orientalism of star trek it's just you know yeah. all all life that is not civilized and you know western is here yeah um but i think the vidians it, it, it gives the delta quadrant a little bit of a post-apocalyptic feel doesn't it like a survivor yeah. mentality and i think that's actually why they do ch- chime quite well with the kazon in those early seasons because the kazon are more like you know typically resource focused yeah but there's the idea that the cage on a you know not only at a lower technological level but they are sort of scraping together and they're desperate and they're yeah hungry and you know like water is this big resource which is such a strange idea for kind of the star trek universe that you've got used to yeah i mean it makes a, a strong point very early on that things are different here like you are not in Can- kansas anymore mm. kind of thing mm. everything's a bit scary the rules have changed mm. and what people will do to survive is terrifying so it, it sets the scene really well to have the Vidians and the Kazon and the way that they behave in those early episodes mm. probably the part of the reason that we lose them as themes is there's only so much so far we can go with it and we are moving away from their space and everything but they they were good scene setters yeah and once we've set the scene we don't need that anymore no i agree past it that's one of the stronger rep- yeah that's one of the stronger elements of what phage does to to voyager i think yeah. Yeah. one of the episodes that i i used to like a lot as a kid from that first series is uh faces which is the one where um balana 
is um, again cheesy sci-fi idea, but on yeah. so many of the premises, is separated into her human and Klingon sides. Yeah, I forgot about that actually, and that and that's another body horror kind of thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, basically, yeah. And I think also um, touches on you know like but fascinatingly and problematically touches on that thing about race um, species essentialism in Star Trek. Yeah, you know it, it's. Roxanne Dawson portraying a, a you know a, a, a human and Klingon version of the Blana character. You kind of you know, and obviously the, the Klingon, the full Klingon version has darker skin. Yeah. And you know, is more governed by her like you know emotions and you know unfettered rage and yeah. You start to see how the closer you bring sort of Star Trek species politics and identity stuff to like the real world, it starts getting yeah. really really awkward. Yes, it is, and I, I don't think they really know how they want to handle stuff like that. Mm. I, I mean, I think the the individual races in Star Trek, the way that they sort of are treated, it, it is our parallel to racial relations mm. within human society today, and it's far from utopian the way that they mm. they deal with stuff. I mean, their races are a, a huge deal. Mm-hmm. What species they are, I found it really distasteful that. Neelix calls Tuvok Mr. Vulcan. <laughs> it's like if he was going to call um, Harry Kim Mr. Chinese Guy. Sure, yeah, it's yeah. It's not a thing. That, that, that's not who he is. He has a name. You don't need to say the name of his species to him every time. Stop making a big deal out of it. I suppose, it's not okay. I suppose going back to the original series, you know, you have like um, a lot of people actually find when they watch the original series now, um, McCoy is just unacceptably racist to spot. <laughs> Yeah, it's unacceptably, unacceptably racist. But I suppose, uh, to be generous, Star Trek's always, like I was talking about, the displacement of any religious issue at all onto the Bajorans. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's always used the alien characters right from the very start as a displacement of those issues by showing yeah. a humanity that is united and not caring about that stuff anymore. It's yeah. still, to tackle any of that, it needs to create minority characters yeah you know in in that world you know unless you're just going to ignore those issues altogether which yeah. star trek let's face it it needs you know dozens of episodes every year it, it's got to touch on some of that stuff yeah you know? exactly I mean, I mean and there are things obviously that the episode with balana it's there are things about it that are fundamentally klingon and fundamentally human but it's for me it's not helpful to split her individuality in half mm-hmm. that her as a as a person as an individual everything that makes her up can just be put into one pot or the other mm. um will it be i mean can you imagine how awkward a um you know an episode of the twilight zone or you know an episode of black mirror or something would be these days if, if the premise was a mixed race character is split into a white and black halves yeah i mean that's just unacceptable <laughs> <laughs> well i mean unless someone like jordan peele was directing it you might you might kind of give them I a trust bit of a jordan pass. Peele. <laughs> yeah, yeah. in jordan peele we trust <laughs> yeah i think um some of those early episodes that i remember standing out quite well i mean i i actually when i was a when I was a kid watching it, and I think this is partly my DS9 fandom, I, I loved all the um, Seska stuff. Yeah. I thought she was a cool villain, and I, th- I liked the sort of Kazon politicking, mm. you know, in episodes like Alliances and stuff, which I believe it has its detractors, you know, where you see, like, you kind of learn a bit more about the why the Kazon became like they were, and kind of like that yeah. they themselves are kind of cast out aliens that have, yeah. you know, been exploited in the past and stuff. And on, you know, I mean, not only have we both rewatched some episodes specifically for this podcast, but we've also been rewatching episodes over the last few years, and, uh, you yeah. know, I've, I've seen a lot of them. A lot of it's not aged that well. Yeah. I think the I think the character of Seska, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, in the show that is striving in some ways to be progressively feminist. Yeah. She she I mean she's she's a strong female villain, but she's she's arguably embodying some of the worst stereotypes of of female villains. Yeah, she still needs to be firmly in the pocket of a male leader. Like she doesn't she's either in Chakotay's pocket manipulating him or when she goes to the Kazon, there's a Kazon Lord. They mm-hmm. have names. I've got the Marge. Marge, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, she's in his pocket. She'd never sort of acting under her own steam for herself, really. Mm. The Borg Queen's a well better feminist icon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, we could talk about that a bit more in a bit as well. Um, I suppose the problem, again, you know, I was sort of talking about the, the plausibility of opposition in Voyager. Yeah. I suppose with Seska, you run into, apart from the gender stuff, you run into like how can she have much of a cogent purpose here you know like what mm. what really it, the moment she becomes allied to the Kazon she loses all kind of viability as an actual cr- critic it, it's yeah. she, she's just trying to steal Voyager now for the, for the resource reasons it's yeah. like she doesn't really seem to have when she's first unmasked as a, as a Cardassian she seems to have an idea that she would basically be a better leader and against that walking dead stuff of you know you have yeah. factions within Voyager that think they would be better survivalist uh, figureheads, you know. Yeah. But the moment she leaves the ship and joins the Kazon, it she's just 
she's just she becomes know. immaterial essentially yeah and i think they, they try and make her matter to yeah. both Jane Wayne and Chicote, and again the Chicote. She's got an emotional stuff. pull for for the crew. Uh, you know, when you say Seska's name, oh, we're getting a subspace transmission. Mm. It's Seska. Yeah. That you know, that's a draw. That's a pull mm. for the crew. But in terms of what she can actually practically do, mm. it's kind of muted. And I suppose she remains one of the only uh, uh, sort of big bads, you might say, uh, throughout the show. Mm. The Borg Queen is probably the only, the other main example. Yeah. Of, of you know individuals rather than uh, species that, yeah. that they run into. There's probably other examples I'm thinking about. I know obviously you know Q's always uh, had yeah. this kind of liminal space between baddie and and just trickster. You yeah, know? he is just the trickster god kind of character, isn't he? And he recurs in on Voyager. You know, actually first off in in a second season episode, which is is, is usually held as a classic Death Wish. Um, yeah. Which is is a good one. That is one of the ones I rewatched recently. I'm not a fan of Q. Not a fan of I Q in general. I don't like Q episodes because they don't go anywhere. And a Q for me, because he's this all-powerful thing, and I don't think he, he annoys me, because he's, he's an irritating character. Sure. He can't have an effect on the actual progression of the storyline, mm -hmm. because if he was going to help them, he becomes the kind of equivalent of, well, why didn't they just fly on the back of the eagles to Mordor? I see, Kind yeah. of thing. Yes. So yeah. he can't actually do much without pushing that boundary of, Q, can you just click your fingers and mm. go home, please? So he he's a bit benign. Yeah, yeah. And it irritates me. They have to essentially. I mean, they they touch on this in most. I think the Q episodes in Voyager. They they kind of usually touch on his power and his ability to send them home, and then just brush it aside because yeah. it's too. Again, it's kind of series breaking to really consider it too seriously. Yeah. I think um, I think Q also Q flirting with Picard was always had a bit more of a charm with yeah. it to Q flirting with Janeway. Oh yeah, he's just a full blown sexual predator who will get into her bed, get into her bath. It's it's not that's not okay, and Janeway's just a bit sort of ex exasperated by it, and it's played in what I think is quite a dated sitcommy way, even for yeah, when it was on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I think even as a kid watching it, there's certain ideas of tropes you have which are kind of maybe getting a bit stale, and yeah. I think I think I was aware even then that this is that this is a bit lame. You know, this is. He's yeah, he's he's not okay. It's like the the way that he behaves around Janeway isn't okay, and the. The way it's treated is like he's just being a bit cheeky and it's like no he's looking at her naked that's not all right it's the kind of rascally suitor yeah, isn't it yeah yeah exactly which is not something they you know i, I mean I, I might be forgetting others it's not something they indulge in with jamie a lot so it's kind yeah. of it stands out more yeah well he propositions her doesn't he as well at one point he demands to mate with her i think well yeah there's a lot of um there's a lot of that going on <laughs> um the uh the second season of voyager also contains the famous episode threshold uh mm -hmm. which uh is, is often held up as one of the worst of the entire franchise yeah i think i, I was going to say somewhat unfairly i don't know if i can make that stick uh it, it is ridiculous i mean the, the, the most notable thing about threshold of course is that it, it throws away like potentially a pretty fascinating premise the idea of reaching warp 10 of, yeah. of not just not just get, going very very fast in the social universe but, but being limitless and being able to occupy every space in the universe altogether yeah. to then turn into a bizarre salamander based sexual abduction story exactly and it's another body horror yeah is what that's happened true. when um tom warp 10 tom i refer to that character <laughs> as warp 10 tom i like it uh, as he starts to disintegrate and then it just goes to a completely bizarre area with it that it didn't need to go to why did they have to be salamanders why did they have to... <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> a fair question why did they have to <laughs> and i don't know i don't know whether i'm misremembering that episode but so Tom turns into Salamander and kidnaps the captain and rapes her and they have salamander babies. Essentially, yeah. And and then everything's okay? I think everything's okay. The act of having salamander babies cures Tom of his warp ten disease and we just pretend that never happened? I don't think I don't think the act of having the babies cures him of the warp ten disease. I think that cures the, him. I think the I think the, <laughs> think the doctor's been working on a cure. Okay, so that I just like, happened. I like the idea that you just needed to get it out of his system. Yeah, just have some salamander babies and you'll feel a lot better. <laughs> yeah, That's gonna... the current C D C advice. <laughs> I'd prefer that episode. <laughs> That would be better. I mean, I suppose with any show like Voyager, you've got this certain, and it can get a bit cartoonish in Voyager, I think. You've got that certain get back to the status quo thing that a lot yeah. of Star Trek shows do at the end of an episode. Where, you know, like the, the, the common example, isn't it? And you'll have an episode with a one off character who dies by the end of the episode. Oh, of course, yeah. You know, that's like, and it, I mean, you think like classics like um, is it the Data's Daughter episode in TNG. Yeah. You basically, you basically raise this like hugely important thing which could be have universe changing complications, and you, and you know, it's a good episode, but yeah. you deal with that by 
fridging the character basically yeah, yeah. exactly and and we, we do that in voyager i think the first time we sort of do that kind of big status quo thing is when the all the um when naomi wildman's born mm-hmm. and there's that episode with the second ship and naomi wildman dies oh yes i, Har- I rewatched Harry that Kim one dies and then we find the second ship and we just get the get the new ones yes, <laughs> of that right. ship. So yeah, for the rest of the series, Harry Kim and Naomi Wellman are the parallel, yeah. what, you know, adjacent versions. How of on them. earth? Because Harry Kim knows that he's not Harry Kim. He doesn't have any kind of existential crisis. I don't think Harry Kim has the capacity for existential crises. <laughs> he probably just wasn't paying attention the whole time he was swapping <laughs> ships and timelines. I'd love a character avoid whose job was just to go whenever and explain what the mad stuff that happened in the episode. They're just like, what? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> you know, just a really different character. Yeah, I think there's a really strong run of episodes near the second, near the end of the second season of Voyager, which I was on rewatch. I was struck by there's one one that I liked anyway, and and I thought really held up well was the Thor, which is the one with the um the sort of scary clown uh, figure who's played by Michael McKean, who's more recently been in Better Call Saul, where he was in Spinal Tap. Yeah. But he he they make, it's basically another you know, classic trapped in a holodeck gone wrong one essentially, but they've. They've got kind of um, uh, alien characters that have been um, stored in this program, and like they're, they're, mm. the program is purposes to keep them sane, keep mm. them keep them alive. But it's gone awry, and ah, it's yeah. it plays around with a lot of kind of Stephen King esque kind of it it horror of the scary yeah. clown. And I thought that one worked. Uh, I thought that one held up really well, and it's got some classic ruthless Janeway in it. Yeah, you know where she ends up shutting down the program, uh, you know, and, and defeating the the clown figure. I think she don't like that. That's a, a an example of how the strong body horror in original like the first couple of series gives way to psychological mm-hmm. thriller kind of thing how everyone's minds are being affected by yes. what's going on in the ship and then I think that becomes stronger and the body horror element gets cast aside yeah no, no that's, that's that's true actually yeah and there's a lot of um as you go in with the show um you get episodes dealing with kind of you know nightmare visions and kind of areas yeah. of space that themselves seem cursed almost yeah. in a sort of c.s lewis kind of way you know where, where yeah, just areas aliens have... affecting their memories and you know things like dreams and the concept of reality getting pushed mm-hmm. and not knowing who to trust and there's all kinds of things like that that become much much stronger in the later series i tend to like it when it goes there you know when it makes space uh, itself or the delta quadrant kind of this weird liminal kind of you know it's not it's space but not as you know it to paraphrase yeah. star trek you know it's kind of it, it, it's 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 newly foreign and then yeah. alien. there's um there's an episode i think it's right after the thor there's uh uh the episode two vix <laughs> which is <laughs> it's a whole thing <laughs> that is such a thing <laughs> it's um it's one of the more probably talked about episodes of voyager and um it, it tends to be quite a sort of focal point for you know because we talked a little bit about janeway before yeah um janeway in in fandom in general as a DS Space Nine fan, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff about Cisco as well as as a captain, as, yeah. a, as a good captain figure. Um, you know, Kirk and Picard probably about equally get held up as sort of paragons of of you know hmm. pl- platonic captaincy. You know, yeah, like yeah. In, in the Star Trek fandom, and Avery Brooks and Kate Mulgrew tend to get uh, picked on a little bit. Yeah. Why could that be? <laughs> wonder, why could that be? But you know, I mean, there are there are obviously character things to analyze, and you know, mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of you know. I, I think Deep Space Nine and Voyager, in their own ways, both go for sort of you know what you might call more controversial actions by their captain yeah. figures. So there's some there's some fair stuff to analyze there. Tuvix, so that for anyone who's not seen it, the sort of basic premise is that um, Tuvok and Neelix, who are two you know quite dissimilar characters they hate each other yeah. it's, it's fair well neelix doesn't hate anyone because he's just this annoyingly happy chappy yeah um but tuvok is so done with neelix from day one yes neelix yeah. is really put off by tuvix by t- <laughs> tuvok's <laughs> inability to accept him um and they get smashed together in the uh transporter yeah. and become one person classic transporter tuvix. accident yeah. And you're introduced to this uh, new character. Which is Tuvix. another body horror element. It's basically the fly. It's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Um, Tuvix is played by a, a you know a third actor, a guest actor. Um, mm. So, you know, you've not got that oddness of impersonation. But although you have got the actor trying to sort of capture the mannerisms of the both yeah. characters a little bit. The basic episode is to do with uh, Tuvix getting re- integrated into the crew, uh, overcoming some of the sort of wariness of uh, crew members, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, particularly Kez, who was in, yeah. in a romantic relationship with Neelix. I guess we'll call it a romantic relationship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, Maybe we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that when we talk to him about <laughs> Kez's departure from the show. Um, 
it all seems to be going quite well and mm. and and although people are missing the you know the original separate characters uh it, there's the idea that Tuvix is going to be you know the new member of the crew and yeah he's obviously... integrating quite well with the crew and he's getting to know Kess a bit better on new terms and yeah he's finding his place amongst there the seems crew. to be signs that he's at least as successful as security officer and uh, tactical officer and um you know cook as Neelix is yeah he remembers all powers. of those skills and he you know he's learning them again as a new person but he's got a good foundation to be able to perform those functions still he doesn't seem to have lost much and uh and then of course you know we, we sort of discussed about you know how episodic tv returns to the status quo often yeah. violently and this is one of the more sort of literally violent elements yeah. towards the end of the episode it's it's discovered that there is a way to return to normal it involves splitting him apart uh both crew members will be restored and uh the the the, the sting is tuvix does not want to go yeah tuvix has got used to being tuvix he's got a sense of individuality he's enjoying his existence Mm -hmm. um and it's quite the way they do it is quite difficult to watch in that he's running around the ship begging people to save him Mm. he's kind of dragged kicking and screaming he's essentially dragged from the bridge to to an execution isn't he and the execution has a the hallmarks of a lethal injection isn't it? it's quite yeah. it's quite real it's quite yeah. it's not just like him being put on the transporter pad again although, yeah and then know. he disappears and reappears as yeah. two people but yeah it's it's a very physical process yeah yeah which he which he as you say he deals with through you know accusation and panic and you know um moral outrage and then eventually with this sort of you know cold yeah. you know you, you'll you'll have to live with this resignation yeah and it's quite shocking because I, I don't think there's many um having seen most of star trek um mm. i don't think there are many episodes that maybe push the crew's actions to other crew members i know tuvix is a kind of new form you know yeah. he's unfamiliar in that sense but they, they push where, where, where crew members where any crew members are treated like this yeah exactly. i mean it's the it's, i think it's the action because there's sometimes issues where should we act or should we not if we don't act then someone may be lost or killed or something mm. Um, but it's one of the only instances in which it's decided to take a very decisive violent action against a crew member Mm. Um, and Janeway gets away with it Mm. what do you do you think what do you think was the morally right decision if you if if it was your ship if it was your (laughs) two there'd be a few changes in general (laughs) Um, Captain Proton's going off (laughs) um I think I think as well I, I'd be a bad captain in many levels and I think mm. one is that I'm just a bit too well I, uh, not too nice necessarily but probably would not be very good at taking those tough decisions so I'd, yeah. I'd almost be I'd almost go with the status quo as is the new status quo so I would preserve two bits yeah I think but I don't I do think it's a good Star Trek episode it's easy to laugh at you know but I think like it, it's it takes this kind of you know on the surface of it kind of bullshit sci-fi idea there's there's no real real world analog for yeah. this unless you're talking about just kind of basic utilitarianism you know preserving one life over preserving two yeah. but you know you have got you've essentially had these two people been destroyed and because of star trek you're allowed to recomposite them yeah um but i i, I like it you know I, I do i think it's good that it's talked about and i think mm. it's good that it has a problematic ending I, I've, I've seen some people say that it spoils voyager or at least destroys captain janeway's authority in there heads yeah i don't know if i'd go that far i think as you say there a decision has to be made if you're yeah. doing that setup i think I, d- I don't think she had the right to decide to take a life it's not like she'd decided to smash them together in the first place and destroy tuvok and neelix as individuals mm. she's not correcting her own mistake it it was a thing that happened through no fault of anyone it was mm-hmm. an accident um, but what she did to Tuvix was no accident. Mm-hmm. But I do, I mean, I I love Tuvok, so I'm glad that we got Tuvok back. It's just selfishly, but I don't think ethically it was the right decision to make. I think that's that's very fair. Yeah. I think we should uh, we could talk briefly about the the third season, which is is, is this kind of awkward transition season. I feel mm. in some ways because um you've you've kind of moved out of the first two seasons, uh you've left a lot of the aliens behind. You 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 kind of they're sort of questing on, and there's there's hints being laid about the them getting closer to Borg space, which they'll deal with properly at the end yeah. of the season. It's also the last um the last full season before the departure of Kez, and we'll we'll talk a yeah. little bit about that. And in, in, I suppose we'll sort of talk about that. Um, at the tail end of this and then we'll move on although the slight overlap we'll then move on to talk about the sort of seven of nine phase yeah. of the show um, but in in the third season in general and actually in the first two seasons um, Kez is one of the more kind of foundationally intriguing characters that you could you could introduce isn't she yeah. uh, in the sense that she's this new 
quite new life in general because mm. the accompanying species only live till I think it's projected about sort of nine years. Nine years, yeah. Nine years is it? Which I think again, you know, you talk about children's potential to be aware of TV tropes. Even when I was watching that as a kid, I was like, oh, so she'll last about as long as this series will then. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, you had that How in my head. Convenient. I was like, yeah, you know, that that's clearly what they're doing there. Yeah. You know, they're setting up this character, making it even more ridiculous that she leaves the show after about three seasons. You know? yeah. It's like she has all that potential to sort of match up with and, in a sense, say stuff about television series as a structure themselves. Yeah. She's introduced as a uh, kind of waif-like uh, young woman, but probably, I don't know, she probably looks like she's about... I don't know, twenty two, something yeah, like that. At the start yeah, of the show, early twenties. Yeah, yeah a, a young woman, but she's a, she's meant to be about a year and a half old, two years old. Yeah, I think she's supposed to be about two when they leave. She's kind of introduced in the pilot episode as 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 having formed a relationship. I, th- I think I, th- I think just pretty explicitly a sexual, a sexually romantic relationship with Neelix. Yeah, which is uncomfortable, because um, Neelix is a fully grown man. Um, she, I mean. It would be one thing if her character weren't also portrayed as quite naive. Like she is quite naive and young. She's lived below the surface mm. for ages. You know, she hasn't. She doesn't have all the experience that Neela, is a fully grown man who travels around all the time, has. So there's an element of grooming to it. Isn't yeah, there? the, the, the idea least. that Neela is exploiting her naivety, and also she's dead cute and pretty, and Neela is an ugly man. She is, and the 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 Ocampans, I think, are probably one of the more impressive races portrayed in Star Trek because she seems to be, uh, you know, being ripped from her home and you know, like like yeah. you know, exploited as a, as a child and everything, and and then brought into Voyager. She seems like instantly very capable. Picks up loads of you know learning in the sort of hydroponics yeah. bay and the medical bay. She essentially acts as you know a sort of very um very Doctor Who esque companion figure to the Doctor yeah, for a lot of those early seasons, um and I think um you know it makes it even all the more awkward that she's clearly this very capable i guess we're meant to think of her basically as a young woman yeah who who is being kind of batted around between sort of slightly seedy father figures yeah <laughs> um, yeah i suppose you could say some of the and characters also, have more positive influences on her well tom paris has a bit of a like thing you know they have they have they spend a bit of time together and there's a idea that there's a romantic connection mm. and he's like the seediest most predatory flyboy kind yes. of yeah, that's character true. isn't he so you i mean you it do doesn't have... seem to trouble anyone i don't think they ever yeah. bring up the kind of you know what we'd consider to be radically underage thing yeah because i suppose i suppose in its defense in its defense we've tread very carefully here mm. um i suppose they're talking about someone who will live to the ripe old age of nine so if she lived yeah. a whole life, she would be underage. Well, when I from our perspective, well, yeah, but the, the, there is the point at which I think it becomes definitively inappropriate is the point where she goes through a camp and puberty. Ah, uh, yeah. So there's the episode where she goes through this kind of grimy physical uh, process, which is her opportunity to have a child, which is the equivalent of puberty. That's which, quite a body horror one as well. Yeah, and she goes through this early, which demonstrates to us the viewer that the whole time we've known her she has been prepubescent that is a pretty a pretty nasty connotation of that episode isn't it yeah and <laughs> one of the one of the things that so she has to go through this it's quite a good episode in terms of um is there's a feminist element to it in terms of her deciding if she ever wants to be a mother um she speaks to jane ray about it she has to make the decision for herself um, but neelix is as her partner what like what kind of say should he get does she does she want to have a child at all she does does she want it to be with neelix all of this is thrust upon her because this this puberty happens once and that's your one chance to conceive she doesn't know whether this will happen again um and it does throw up all of this stuff about her being prepubescent and being too she feels like she's too young to make these decisions mm. which again throws another sort of shadow over her relationship with neelix and whether it's um appropriate or not mm. and at the end of the episode when she's been through the process they've not decided not to have a child but they, she, this puberty thing might happen again they might have another child um, and they decide that they they want to have a kid and Kess says something to me looks like oh I'm sure if when we have a kid he'll love you or something like that and Neelix goes not he I want to have a daughter and I want her to look just like you that's, that's not good creepy so <laughs> creepy so that's the point at which I was very much done with Neelix. Yes. I mean, Kez at the end of, uh, oh, at the very beginning of season four, technically, uh, d- departs and it, it, it's such a, 
it's such an obvious one in one out uh, exchange oh, for seven it's yeah. not it's not directly pegged to it but it's it, a revolving it's... door of naive I think, I, I think seven's really being i think she's still being like removed she's still in sick bay being removed from her borg implants as yeah. kez departs the ship you know yeah, it's yeah. kind of it's such an obvious exchange um did you ever see the skipping ahead but just, just relevant to kez did you ever see the one in the later seasons i think it's in about season six where kez comes back yeah and she's very powerful and starts smashing the ship up yes um yeah seems like she's angry she's like almost um um in a meta way she's kind of angry at the show yeah yeah <laughs> so she's trying to rescue her younger self when she comes back yeah because there's time travel involved in that episode where you you get to see you know they sort of play around with the styles of the earlier show yeah but yeah kez is kez has essentially become this kind of you know carrie-esque figure you know yeah. like like her, her sort of telepathic powers which are always developing through those early seasons of the show have kind of turned her into this kind of vengeful kind yeah. of witch figure really you know it's yeah. kind of a, it's probably taken it it's probably curdled the character you know about as cruelly as you could do you know yeah. for someone who at least had a lot of potential in those early shows yeah it's, and it's it's odd to see her like that because she was always quite sort of fragile and um she was just this delicate cute little fragile thing mm. and then she i mean when she did depart the show it was it was quite nice it was i mean very heavy-handed one in one out for seven mm. but you know she stopped living in neelix's pocket and being second to the doctor and having to run to janeway when she needed things mm. you know she took this independent step and went off on her own mm. and achieved her potential mm. because she sort of kind of had this transcendent kind of experience when she left i like the seven and nine uh you know gets the, like gets introduced like for the reasons we've discussed already it, it's it doesn't feel like there's not room on the ship it, it doesn't feel like there's not room on the ship it feels like it's a shame that kez leaves yeah, it's not like she ne- she wouldn't necessarily be a highlight best of all time Star Trek character, but they they have laid enough groundwork and they've given her enough to deal with in those early seasons. Yeah, where there is that space for her to grow, like you could imagine her. You know, I mean, I don't. They could do different. You can imagine her ending up in the Starfleet uniform in subsequent seasons. Yeah, maybe even rising to a sort of position of like you know non conventionally Starfleet rank power on the ship. You know, yeah, just keeping growing and growing and becoming like you know one of the more impressive characters by the end of the show. And it feels like by getting rid of the, the end of the third season or the beginning of the fourth season she's not quite there yet yeah. and instead they just a, a, essentially abandon it you know yeah it, it's, it's a bit um brutal the way they do away with her i looked at the team and i tried to make it boil but nothing happened without tennis's help i just can't do it nevertheless your psychokinetic abilities are still part of you they might resurface one day to be honest i never want to see that part of myself again to which part are you referring? To the part of me that got pleasure from destroying those plants in the Aeroponics Bay. To the part of me that was tempted to go with Tannis. I never realized I had such dark impulses. Without the darkness, how would we recognize the light? Do not fear your negative thoughts. They are part of you. They are a part of every living being. Even Vulcans. You? The Vulcan heart was forged out of barbarism and violence. We learned to control it, but it is still part of us. To pretend it does not exist is to create an opportunity for it to escape. They could have put more work into her. Apparently the network was torn between getting rid of her or Harry Kim. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that really puts it into perspective. Oh. Just think, we could have lost Harry Kim. Yeah, the forever ensign. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the start of the... Uh, fourth season um with the scorpions two-part um we've talked a little bit about the borg already and the way that voyager sort of um approached the borg um with with the, the species 8472 uh, plot line um seven of nine comes aboard the ship initially as a borg drone and is you know deborgified quite mm. rapidly uh put in a, a a very sexy skin type of course suit or a succession of them um and starts sort of forging new dynamics with the crew a little bit you know we talked a little bit before about how great jerry ryan is yeah how seven uh, as a character and as a you know vehicle for the actress is is, is is a great um kind of refresh for the show and it certainly was you know seen so at the time you know mm. seen it, i think it was a rate it was a huge ratings boost you know, yeah the, the single biggest boost it got i suppose akin in a sense to uh wharf joining ds9 at yeah, about the same yeah. stage um which you know yeah, which i think you could compare it to um partly because of the network pressures involved as well mm. um from that phase of the show i've heard a lot of people talk about season four as being a highlight of voyager um a lot of kind of like fervent voyager fans um there's there's some stabs towards more 
arc based or sort of proto art based stuff there's the year of hell two-parter for example yeah yeah which i've heard a lot of people talk about as being all and i can certainly see where they're coming from as being almost like a trial run or like a little sidebar where you see what voyager could have been yeah yeah i, I think because the year of hell that's um that's one of the last things that kess was um she was instrumental in figuring out how to avoid the year of hell wasn't she is that is that is that one with her in it i think that might be after her departure i thought that she kept going back that isn't that when she starts going back in time she keeps jumping in time because her chronotons are off or some <laughs> some pseudoscience <laughs> like that. we all have days like that yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think I, i'll look i'll look this up i think yeah. that a year of hell is a post kez episode okay i think seven and nine's involved in that but there is, there's definitely a lot of time. Jumping. No, I, I mean, um, it's a, it's a post Kess episode. But I think there was an, an episode with Kess in it where, she links to the year. Oh, of hell, no, I think you're right. She predicts it. You're talking about Fury, she... the one where she comes yes, back. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes. You're right. There is part of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's involved. Yeah. Um, the year of hell two part itself. I, I think it's 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 a neat idea. You know, you've got the kind of uh, the time ship that with this sort of obsessive Captain yeah. Nemo's figure who's trying to redo his uh, tragic past you know that yeah. is a species i remember being impressed by the idea of like tweaking time and constantly readjusting it but it almost being a time and the chronology of the star trek universe almost being like the car in father ted that's the raffle prize yeah whereas yeah. if you keep tapping it with a hammer you'll just eventually you just end up smash the shit out of it <laughs> <just> <laughs> basically you'll, you'll end up with an unus- unusable thing you'll never you'll never get back to where you were there's something yeah. great about that um but i think i think i definitely see what people talk about when they talk about you know year of hell is almost like an exercise in what if things mattered in Voyager? You know, what if it was less episodic? What if yeah. it was much more about the desperate scramble for resources on the ship? What if it was about damage that lasted? What if it was about the sort of degradation of of the ship and of, yeah. of, of the crew's morale? And and I, and I think it's a great glimpse into that. It's also probably a reminder of why that couldn't really work. Yeah. Or why or why Voyager would be a very very different show and quite a groundbreaking one if it did. Yeah, it wouldn't feel like Star Trek to me if they'd gone down that route with it permanently. It's mm. it, is too grimy mm. um there, there's a lot about star trek which is kind of clean and clinical mm-hmm. and if you're on this battered ship that's tumbling through space the best it can <laughs> against all odds and people are just dying left right and center mm. and there's this horrible sense of desperation that's it's a different show altogether and it's not it's not the star trek we kind of know and love and i think i think point. star trek has always benefited from those glimpses hasn't it into those kind yeah. of universes like you know whether you go back to the original series with mirror mirror or mm. um in tng you know one of the more regarded episodes is yesterday's enterprise where you get a glimpse at a, a more beleaguered militaristic yeah you know d- d- desperate times uh, dark mirror of the federation yeah it, it's great to have those glimpses but i sort of agree with you that you know that's that's kind of not really a, i mean you could argue for ages about what at core star trek is yeah but that's that's I, I suppose it, it one of the functions it serves is glimpses at darker universes and possibilities, but mostly to shy away from them. Yeah. Mostly to reject them. Mostly to yeah. solve them. You know. Yeah, it's kind of uh, look what we could be doing. Aren't you glad we're not? Yes. <laughs> it's there is nice, a bit of that. nice for a bit, but it's fine. I think you were saying you've um you're you're not of uh, you've not seen any Battlestar Galactica, have you? I'm talking no, about the I Nautilus haven't. Version. No. It, no. It's it's interesting because I I have I have and I, because you've not seen it, I won't get into that here, but it, it's there's a lot of a sense in which Battlestar Galactica the Naughty's version is a response to elements of Deep Space Nine and Voyager and and you know partly because of the presence of Ronald D. Moore you know who was mm. a creative figure largely on Deep Space Nine but also also partly on Voyager uh, briefly um you get you get a, you get a sense that Battlestar Galactica is taking a lot of those elements and and kind of fusing them to form like his idea of what where sci-fi popular yeah. tv sci-fi should go from there like you know people have talked about you know Battlestar Galactica being kind of the Voyager premise with more of a DS9 sensibility okay, and obviously taking both of those ideas further there's there's a lot of DS9 stuff on Battlestar Galactica there's a lot of like um, non-human characters who compose as humans, you get the sort of changeling okay. themes uh, you get a lot of the kind of you know in wartime difficult decisions are made yeah. but from Voyager you get a lot of the these characters desperately searching for home, they're yeah. kind of nomadic you know they've, there's, mm. there's they're, 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 they're that you get a lot more stuff about knitting disparate groups together to form a crew yeah. and and you actually get quite a lot of political factions in Battlestar Galactica it's you know it's, it's fairly rudimentary stuff but it, it's 
it's there in a way that Voyager never gave it room for. Yeah, it's allowed to breathe in Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true. And you know, like, and again, without getting into detail, you know, there's there's a lot. I, I as a Star Trek fan, I when I watched Battlestar Galactica, I guess like you know, a couple of years after it was on in the late noughties, I was I was seeing a lot of Star Trek DNA in it. Put it yeah. that way, I was seeing a lot of stuff where this episode is a bit like that Star Trek episode, but taken a bit. For, you know, it, its crudest turned up to eleven, mm. but at its most interesting. You, you're just giving things a bit more space to breathe and you kind yeah. of look into it a bit and, and again affecting more consequences yeah um some of the other things um i like about the sort of fourth season of, of voyager is you know you, you you're featuring the borg a bit you know i think you're introducing the herogen hunters yeah. who aren't the most memorable i mean they're kind of a generic um predator knockoff yeah. in some ways oh, God, aren't they? yeah yeah um i think you get to around the fourth series of voyager and you get into i can s- I can see it drop off a little bit from there in terms of you getting closer to home, the the urgency's not there, and you get a lot more of the sort of temporal jiggery pokery <laughs> that mm-hmm. happens mm-hmm. where we get time travel and different sort of timelines that we can go on and we and we can tweak and play with uh, the timelines like like you were saying, which whilst they're interesting concepts it takes a lot of the urgency out of it as well in that mm. well we can just like nothing really matters anymore once you've gone down that route quite a few times and you know that you can just tweak anything that's gone wrong mm. it does take a bit of the urgency and the severity out of their situation yeah and again it's the consequences thing isn't it when you know that when the universe the sort of temporal foundation of the universe itself seems a bit more flimsy or, or yeah. mutable yeah. Um, you know, you deal with that a lot of Doctor Who, don't you? Like, you know, how permanent is anything? You know, how, yeah. uh, how 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 permanent are any of these narrative things? You know, um, I think also the fourth series is probably you know like w- between Scorpion uh, Part Two and uh, the end, uh, um, the, the finale of season four, uh, where you've got so, uh, Seven being abducted by uh, you know an anti Borg fanatic, basically. Yeah. Um, and uh, across that whole season, you've got ideas of whether seven is going to be successfully um integrated into the crew how how mm. sort of irredeemably alien she is you know whether she can be reconstructed and whether she wants to be even yeah um, and there's times when that she comes back into contact with the borg and there's that pull on her there's definitely elements of her that sort of yearns for the collective still yes yeah and i think that's it it's most acute in season four is it with episodes like the raven you know where she finds yeah. out about exactly what happened to her parents and it's you know there's this real like horror horror movie elements that aren't there like visually there's yeah and i mean she is also experiencing humanity in that episode in this kind of unexpected and terrifying way because she's having dreams about this ship and this experience and she has a full panic attack when she goes to that ship and she realizes that's where she was abducted from that's where the boar got them and destroyed her family Mm. um so she has a, a full panic attack and someone who's not had emotions for most of her life this is that's all really sort of kind of dysphoric for her mm. that is one of my favorite tuvok moments though tuvok is a very very funny deadpan character because seven has a full-blown panic attack and then it does all of this um explanation of oh i've just you know realized this is the ship this is my parents ship this is our last time i was here and tuvok just goes fascinating <laughs> <laughs> he's fantastic he's always great with his reaction <laughs> he is. tim ross doesn't get enough credit i think yeah he is brilliant i love tubok i think um i think that treatment of seven is it's most acute in the fourth season and after that we'll sort of like gradually go into the fifth season and, and, and beyond but I, I think uh in the fifth season they have a like encountering the board queen uh, yeah and you were talking before about the board queen being another you know villain and kind of um, a foil to Janeway as well. Yeah. We were talking before about Janeway's sort of mother figure roles that she goes through. Mm. I think there's, you know, in the fifth season and beyond, you get this um, almost overt um, fighting over Seven. Uh, oh, yeah. A, a real Absolutely. rivalry for control, which makes no real, like, canonical sense because Seven of Nine is never really shown to be anything other than just a drone. Yeah. So that the, the I mean, I, I, I actually think, you know, I know we, we watched First Contact last year, didn't we? Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I'm not a fan of the Borg Queen in general. No. And, and I think one of the problems with her is, is that when you give the Borg personal grudges yeah. or an expression for personal grudges, you're kind, of, you're kind of contradicting what they are. Yeah, she, the Borg Queen does, because she is, she behaves acutely as an individual and 
that's not the Borg. Mm. Um, and she's she's got personal attachments to stuff, personal hatreds towards Janeway. Mm-hmm. You know, there's times when she sees Voyager and she's like, oh, Yeah, she's Janeway. practically like, curses. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's an arch enemy kind of thing. Whereas the Borg should be neutral yeah. and they all they do is see a set of uh, people that they could mm-hmm. assimilate way up the odds of being able to do it go for it or don't that's why it's very hard to portray villains like that isn't it especially when they're meant to be embodying something as monolithic as the Borg because you'd think that even if it, well, let's say Voyager destroyed 20 Borg cubes across the the, the course of the series yeah that you, you would think the Borg Queen's reaction to that would be eh we'll, we'll get to that yeah you know I mean, oh, oh, that, oh that's interesting logically if Voyager destroys 20 ball cubes you would think the ball queen would look at Voyager and go statistically there's a decent chance we're not going to come out of this very well I'm gonna, just going to get off yeah or um, or you know that, that what they're doing is interesting we'll, yeah. we'll continue to adapt yeah exactly you know I think I think I think again with the Borg you know and, and arguably by the end of the next generation I've not put this on Voyager by the end of the next generation slash first contact they're already getting into these waters mm. that, that you really don't want to go into them too much and yeah I, I think when, especially when it comes to like what their collective consciousness actually is because by creating the character of the Borg Queen you're kind of almost making it seem like they're under a spell yeah of a, of a, of a, of a being yeah that is the Borg Queen or like the Borg Collective is this thing which is controlling all the drones and i'm like i think it's much more it, it's it's more scary to think they're actually all they're all the borg yeah exactly and there's just something so on un, we un, are the borg yeah. is scarier than we all work for this lady there's the episode unimatrix zero where there's the the idea of the borg resistance and it comes up um mm-hmm and the the ball can all have their sort of like individual individuality back within mm. Unimatrix Zero mm. and sort of plan um a f- sort of counter attack mm-hmm. through their I don't know, their communication nodes or whatever mm-hmm. to try and destabilise and that's quite an interesting idea. But then again when the way they handle the Borg Queen and her reaction to it, she's she's pissed off. Yeah. Yeah, it's personal for some yeah, reason. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's di- it's difficult to go as far as they want to go with the Borg without putting a face to the Borg. Mm, mm. I Be- think it's just an irreconcilable difficulty, you know. Yeah, I think of the course. more you tug at that, you'll just kind of, you know, like you, you'll just uh, expose the contradictions, really. You know? Yeah. I think uh, the Unimatrix Zero, that's uh, at the very end of season six slash. Uh, is it? I, I seven, have it, it in my head around season five. I think it's it, it, it's interesting because I suppose that things like Unimatrix Zero, it, 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 it probably, I'll check this, but it probably is a post Matrix episode. So you've got that idea of kind of resistance groups being also kind of hacker groups, you know? Kind yeah. Of taking on these kind Hack of. Hack the mainframe. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, they had all, all that kind of cool uh, late 90s kind of hacker um, yeah. imagery, but also that kind of idea of. Uh, you know robotic uh, overlords being defeated by resistance groups yeah yeah um scrappy little individuals fighting the system indeed yeah and um, there's a, there's a there's another two part of the one that i think from memory it's poised on the between the fifth and the sixth seasons uh, equinox part one and two yeah which i, I sort of referenced before and I, I, there's definitely things i have to say about battlestar about that very briefly afterwards um the premise of equinox is that um the voyager crew encounter a, a, another crew the the uss equinox um mm. Who have been? I think I think they're there because of the caretaker array as well. From yeah. what I remember, and you basically again a bit like Year of Hell, you've kind of give, given a glimpse at a crew which have had a rougher ride of things. Yeah, and have definitely made different moral choices. Yeah, um, I suppose there's a long history in Star Trek of showing like you know evil admirals is a bit of a trope in Star Trek, isn't yeah. it? But also like evil or, or not or, or morally flawed other captains who are captains compared to. Yeah, and this is ultimately that you're kind of given a uh, you know a male captain who has made some different choices to Janeway, and mm. generally they are held up to be worse choices. Yeah, yeah. There's this idea that even though they got trapped in the Delta Quadrant, and even though you know sometimes they make decisions that are going to take them further from home, and they're supposed to be getting back, at least their moral fortitude is intact mm-hmm. in Voyager, which is kind of damaged by Janeway and the two Vixens yes. and <laughs> all the two Vixens. Uh... Yeah, let's ignore that. But you know, there's that idea that no matter how long it takes to get home, no matter if we ever get home, we are going to be true to ourselves the whole time. And mm. but then the Equinoxes, they've been corrupted by their situation. So I think that episode is an opportunity for us to like sort of 
take pride in ourselves as as Voyager people. Yes, yes. Um, There's and... a bit of kind of raising the flag a bit and saying, you know, however dark we get, sometimes we are still, we're still adhering to these Federation principles and that basic things like not exploiting other life forms. Yeah. Which the Equinox is shown yeah, to be yeah. doing, you know. Yeah. I think essentially they're using aliens as fuel, aren't they doing something like that? Something along those lines. It is a bit grim. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a. The reason I would mention Battlestar is there's a um, there's a there's a plot line in Battlestar Galactica involving a ship called the Pegasus, um, mm. which actually features um, Michelle Forbes, who played uh, Ensign Rowe on oh, TNG. Okay. She comes in and she her she's the equivalent character who's the the, the commander of the other ship, mm. and she comes in and it's and it's almost uh, for me as a Trek fan, it was almost just a, rem- a remake of Equinox, really. Right. It yeah. was it was just it was just that, but with slightly more. Um, direct um, consequences and the the darker implications made yeah yeah m- made made um, more uh, grim dark I suppose you know yeah it, it, coming out into the open more yeah so that's an interesting one to watch um, there's a couple of episodes in the sort of later half of the series that I, I I thought were worth mentioning and actually two that I've I think only seen on the Netflix uh, rewatch mm. one's um, Course Oblivion which I think is in season five where the basic premise is that um, you're aboard a starship Voyager who, where things start to go wrong, the, the ship's deteriorating, yeah. uh, crew members are getting ill, um, the, the very fabric of the ship seems to be falling apart, mm. and you, at quite an early stage of the episode, find out why. And if anyone's not seen that episode, I'll actually do the unusual podcast thing, I'm not spoiling it, but it, <laughs> it's one to check out, because it's kind of, it's one of the, it's up there probably with episodes of Star Trek like Cause and Effect from TNG, where it's essentially a good Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. But it also relies on the familiarity of you having a crew that you know and love, and you know you, you it the 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 dark areas it goes to, are kind of partly to do with the fact that things like that are not meant to happen on Star Trek. Yeah. There's another episode I think it's in season six called Blink of an Eye, which I've definitely not seen before. Um, watch oh, it on really? Netflix, where the basic premise is that they go to a planet where uh, time moves. You know, because of some, you know, completely manufactured anomaly reason, yeah. uh, time moves much much faster on the planet. Yeah, um, I remember watching that. I rewatched that recently, actually. You've seen that one, yeah. yeah. So, so Voyager's in orbit and it becomes this sort of fixture in the night sky. Yeah. And but you know everything's moving much much faster, and the, the whole civilization is developing. But with Voyager as this kind of uh, astronomical slash religious. Yeah, symbol. there's this symbol of re- like they kind of revere it or, or fear it in some ways. Yeah, and it becomes a focus of their kind of equivalent of the space program and yeah. developing flight, and you know it's a and that that was just a really neat idea that I think you know it's it's not shockingly original. I think I've come I'd probably come across it already in kind of you know parody sci-fi by then. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a Treehouse of Horror that works with some of the same ideas. So is it the <laughs> um, the Futurama where Bender ends up floating through space and whole civilizations are growing on? His oh stomach? God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me of that. You know, if you yeah. watch enough sci-fi, the parodies all start to blend into the actual subject yeah matter. of course um but those are a couple that stood out in the later seasons i mean is there any do you think there's any i think even a lot of voyager fans tend to think that towards the end of the show things went off the boil a bit yeah i, I would agree with that like i've said before it, it lost momentum and there was a few things that they did to try and inject new sort of um new interests like the borg children mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and that, I mean, that's a way of broadening Seven's character because she essentially comes becomes a mother mm-hmm. character to the kids, um, specifically Icha. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a way of her sort of exploring new emotions and, and things like that. Mm. Um, Don't they also give her a romantic relationship or a nascent romantic relationship with uh, Chakotay? They do, yeah. Uh, I don't know why they did that. Yeah. I just... She well, she starts to explore the idea of romance and creates a Chicote hologram program, uh, like on the holodeck. Uh, oh, I remember that being really awkward. It, it was really awkward because I think something goes wrong when she's in there, and she, it sort of gets discovered that that's what she was doing in the holodeck. <laughs> she was on a date with a holographic version of the Chicote, which is just mortifying in the workplace, isn't it? Voyager's HR reviews must be a nightmare. Awful awful i would not want to be head of hr on voyager such a backlog as well i think the problem with that as well as you know obviously they're still questioning around for things to do with maybe the more underused characters in voyager including chakotay but and there's the other thing not again not being rude about the actors but robert beltran is a very handsome man but he but but certainly as playing chakotay he's Mm. not very charismatic he's not and also and you've got a problem with the fact that seven of nine is just iconically hot Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and however handsome robert beltran may be there's just no one on that crew that's remotely in her league. That's good enough for her. No. <laughs> yeah. You sound very protective. I am protective. <laughs> I think it's um, 
we'll pr- we'll probably wrap up the sort of discussion of Voyager now um, because you know there, there's so much you can go into with it with, mm. a, with a series that has I think you know more than 170 episodes across yeah, seven yeah. seasons. There's so many elements that you could highlight, so many hidden gems, yeah. um, and obviously so many low points as well. You know, we, we've talked about some of the more well known. Um, I think overall, um, I've really enjoyed rewatching a lot of Star Trek Voyager, and I th- some of that is because um, the the latter two seasons are kind of pretty much unknown to me or were. And some of that's just because so much of it is aged so interestingly. I'll, I'll say yeah. that neutrally. So much of it's a lot of it's aged badly. Um, I think a lot of it's aged quite well. Um, yeah. I think some of the more progressive things they were trying to do, both within Star Trek, you know, canon itself, mm. uh, and and kind of in TV sci-fi, you know, have have done quite well for themselves in yeah. the light of day. You know. Yeah, I do. I think I still think it holds up in the series definitely, and it's still it's relevant. Um, there's there are, there will always be things that haven't aged well, and there's things that were problematic about it at the time, and are perhaps more problematic now that we're all older and woke. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I'm. As to be honest, having revisited it recently and rewatched it, perhaps with more critical eye, um, knowing that we're going to do this podcast, I am. Um, perhaps maybe a little bit more of a fan of it mm-hmm. than I ever was and you know I was always a fan but having watched it a bit more actively I mean it, it was really trying for some stuff it, mm-hmm. it, sometimes it fell short but the ambition of it as a sort of TV project I really respect it's uh it's interesting that we've not discussed the finale at all mm. they get home don't they uh do they <laughs> <laughs> I think we can leave that there. Um, yeah, to be honest, that the the ending is kind of a bit of a letdown to it because they get. I mean, we already know that they're going to get home mm. a couple of seasons before you know they're they're in regular contact with Starfleet mm. back home. Uh, they're getting these transmissions through, so that kind of we know it's going to happen. And when they end it, it, there's kind of this Deus Ex Machina kind of thing where they just use the temporal jiggery pokery mm, to make mm. it happen. Janeway just comes back through time and goes, "All right, come with me. We're off." <laughs> and there's stuff going on with the Borg at the time, and it's all very exciting. But yeah, it's very amped up. But it's also very abrupt, isn't it? And yeah. I think I think with you know taking the the sort of '90s Star Trek series as a whole, um, Voyager. I, I'm not sure if there was any such thing as a satisfying finale to Voyager possible because mm. it's such a linear. You know, it should it should be possible because it's it's got a goal. It's one of the shows with yeah. an actual goal, but it just feels so tacked on at the end. And as you say, like it's not like like what other ending could there be? You know, yeah. So there's no surprise to it. In DS Nine, you have you know, there's don't get me wrong, a lot of flaws to the DS Nine finale. Yeah. But but the it, things are wrapped up. You know, things are things are resolved. I think probably the most enduringly great Star Trek finale is still all good things from TNG, and that's partly yeah. because it it has this wonderful ability to sort of project forward and show you possible elements of the show's future as well as yeah. nostalgic you know elements of the show's past but 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 not actually peg you to any of those elements and just kind of have that kind of glorious kind of suggestion that these characters will always be here yeah the, yeah. Voyage, the voyage continues which you know? is what i i need <laughs> that's <laughs> why to stop my deep deep remorse at the end of that show <laughs> that's what i need too and um so i'm going to play another audio clip uh, and then we'll just have a brief uh, epilogue where we talk a little bit about kind of star trek today and uh, what it means to us, you know, going forward in our lives, I guess, you know. And um, yeah, so we'll be right back after that. Somewhere in that totality known as the universe is a galaxy called the Milky Way. Tucked into the corner of that galaxy is a planet named Earth. On that planet is a city called Mantua. Go straight ahead, past the fountain, turn right, then left then right again. You'll find yourself walking along the water, listening as a man sings of his beloved's unfaithful heart. And even the fish begin to weep. Quando la donna è mobile. La donna è mobile, qual più mal vento, muta da cento, e di pensiero. Sempre un amabile, leggiadro viso, in pianto in riso, e menzognero. La donna è mobile, qual più mal vento, muta da cento. Edipensier, 
Balance is driving him to mate. We won't be able to reason with him. Tuvok, I understand. You are a Vulcan man. You have just gone without for seven years about. Paris, please find a way to load a hypospray. I will give you the sign. Just aim for his behind. Hormones are raging. Synapse is blazing. It's all so very illogical. Okay, we're back. Um, and Isabel, just uh, before we go, I just wanted to talk to you uh, just briefly, I guess, um, about um, where you're at now with Star Trek. So you're, you know, you're in fandom, uh, how the franchise has treated you over the last few years, but also just kind of, I suppose, what part, what role it occupies in your life now? Um, it's It's been pretty absent from my life for many years. So after Voyager, there was a void. And then Enterprise happened so i put the first episode on and heard the theme tune and turned it off <laughs> <laughs> that was that's not... about as far as i got to yeah. yeah um it i didn't seem i can't really slag it off because i didn't really <laughs> watch any of it I yeah did yeah i'm so i've scattered I, I think i've probably watched about 10 episodes of it total yeah you know across four seasons i never i never i've never really done a rewatch or a watch a watch it would be for me for yeah longer. Some, there's not it's just not doing anything for me I can't really go into a lot of detail because I didn't give it much of a chance I'll admit that but mm. I don't know I think Star Trek this what we've had of Star Trek has given me what I need from Star Trek mm. Mm. and I'm you know I'm comfortable with there not being new Star Trek series all the time yes yeah I appreciate what we've got and it, uh, that's not to say that if they were to make more series and films that I liked mm -hmm. that wouldn't be great but I don't need to invest myself with every new Star Trek product that comes out. Um, I'm happy to not watch Enterprise. I didn't watch Discovery either. Mm -hmm. um, the new Star Trek films, the J.J. Abrams era Star Trek films, first one I enjoyed. Yeah. I really like that. They went downhill from there. Yeah, yeah, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> um, listeners will not be able to see the gritted teeth. Like the the clenched jaw at the at the mention of the J J Abrams era <laughs> Star yeah. Trek films. Well, I think I think I wrote you know everything from Enterprise onwards, mm. uh, and that includes the J J Abrams movies and 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 Discovery largely. There's I've not got time to go into it now, but the, a lot a lot of it it didn't mesh with me. But a lot of it yeah. I also just wrote off kind of from the start because those those are all kind of kind of very noticeably actually those are all kind of prequels. To yeah, that's, degrees. that's a very good point. And I just saw, it, I, I think even as far back as Enterprise, that sort of something about that stuck in my craw a little bit. I was kind of like, this is this is clearly a franchise that's about to go through a phase of not moving forward. Yeah. Now I think back in two thousand and uh, you know two, I didn't realize how much that was true, how much that was going to be yeah. true. Yeah. Because because and this is why I've been, I, I, I think I think it's okay at this stage. You know, I mean, we're both we're both in our thirties now. We can yeah. talk about this kind of you know childhood adolescent fascination we have that will stay with us but i think it's okay for some fascinations to basically occupy just to sort of re i think it's good to rewatch. i think it's yeah. good to rediscover and to reevaluate. but it's kind of okay to just say i'm full now yes exactly i, I don't have I, I love star trek i don't have an insatiable thirst for star trek that i will cram anything into to mm. try and <laughs> yeah to try and satisfy um i'm yeah i can i can do without a lot of the stuff that isn't my Star Trek, yeah, as yeah. we started by discussing, um, been watching Picard. Yeah, I've I've been watching Picard too. <laughs> um, Picard, I, I have nice things to say about it. Controversially, I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of the nice things that I have to say about it is, I like Captain Jean Luc Picard, and he's in it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he. That's true. So that that indicates how much I'm reaching. Patrick Stewart is in it. There's a dog. 
the fact that he calls his dog number one is the <laughs> nicest thing <laughs> in the world. And so that's you get that from sort of the opening five minutes of the first episode, and it is downhill from there in terms of what you can get from that show. Mm. Um, Me and Isabel did discuss getting together as part of this podcast and discussing Star Trek Picard in, in general, just because we thought you know people would want to yeah. talk about that and hear, hear about that at this juncture. We've decided not to do that because uh, as of recording this there's been eight episodes of 10 aired so it would be you know even by our very unfair standards it would be unfair to yeah. judge it at this point yeah um we will judge it harshly when it i'd imagine <laughs> so <laughs> i'd imagine so um yeah i'm i'm not impressed with it just to speak about it vaguely i'm not that impressed with it as a series mm. i'm not that impressed with the narrative it seems a little bit all over the place yeah yeah the return of Jerry Ryan. Um, there is the return of Jerry Ryan as Seven of Nine, and even before she's done anything, mm-hmm. uh, implant, uh, Borg implants look shit. Like, they were really detailed and sort of shiny, mm. <laughs> but they look in Picard. They look like they've been made out of like grey plasticine mm. that's been stuck to a head and stuck to her fingers. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe that's because they've degraded over the years or something, but. Mm sort of like bionetic implants why no yeah, yeah. There's, there's, why there's... just make them look the same as they like they looked good in the 90s why in 20 is it, is it 2020 now, <laughs> it's, why? It's 2020 now yeah. <laughs> why in 2020 can they not look good we have the technology people this is in the sense making us uh sound like the most reactionary form of you know nitpicky star trek oh, fans, yeah. isn't it but which we are you know um, yeah. <laughs> i mean i think one, one thing i was realizing about contemporary like yeah contemporary star trek i suppose everything from the, the from the jj stuff onwards is i it, it has a different aesthetic it's not something i'm, I'm as mm. into it has a lot of stuff going on like that um but but what i realized is that you know one one thing one thing that like filled the gap in my star trek fandom you know yeah. from like 2005 to 2015 basically was was doctor who yeah and i came into doctor who very much a new series fan I hadn't grown up with it, so mm. I, it was kind of Christopher Eccleston's the start for me. Yeah. And there's loads of stuff about the new series of Doctor Who that gave fans of the classic series, uh, you know, a migraine essentially. Yes. You know, everything from the kind of aesthetics of it to the um, the focus on you know, romantic plot lines yeah. and you know, kind of fantastical, more fantastical settings. Um, I wasn't aware of any at the time, and I just loved it uncomplicatedly. Yeah. And I'm realizing that my the risk now, especially now that I'm a bit older is that I, if I really whinged online about this sort of stuff <laughs> yeah. that in Star Trek, I'm genuinely not like it. I'm not second-guessing my critical opinion of it. You know, yeah. It's my opinion to have. But but I don't want to be one of those arsehole fans. You know? yeah. I, I don't want to be one of those people who like, people are enjoying Discovery, maybe even enjoying Picard, and I'm just like, you know, good luck to you. you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. If I'm you glad, find I'm something glad. to enjoy about all these things, isn't that great? I'm happy you're enjoying yourself. I mean, yeah. it's one of the reasons I didn't... I could have what I could have sat through the whole of Enterprise and the whole of Discovery, knowing that I wasn't going to get that much out of it. Yeah. Just so that so that I could whinge about it, but I wasn't yeah. going to do that. I just didn't watch it. I think us as Star Trek fans of our era just yeah. need to know that we are of our era. Yeah, and yeah. It doesn't was... mean we can't watch the new stuff or anything, or, or even have an opinion on it. It's just it's just we have our place. <laughs> yeah, we're we know part our of, place. We're part of the fandom. We're not the whole fandom. Yes, exactly. And there's um, people, there's there's kids who would have watched uh, the the Star Trek reboot movie in two thousand nine. Yeah. Uh, you know, they might have watched that when they were seven. You know, and like yeah. now, now they're you know like nearing the end of the teens and they're watching the new shows and they're kind of especially aesthetically, you know, that there's this kind of discovery is kind of the the TV version of those movies. Yeah, yeah. And and you know, I mean, they, you know, they might not be loving any moment. Star Trek's always been patchy, but yeah. that is kind of their Star Trek, you know. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's good if you think of like, we've got our era of Star Trek, which was essentially ds9 voyager era yeah um in terms of when we sort of became aware of it because tng mm. would have come out when we were a bit younger so that i mean we inhabit that sort of era and then our parents era was original series yeah. and now there's an, a new generation of star trek fans and i mean we started the podcast by discussing what we discovered to be my star trek like mm. what our star trek is yeah it's very personally autobiographical this stuff isn't it like, yeah you know. I, I mean everyone just has a subjective experience of it I, it's nice that even though the new star trek stuff that's coming out now may not be for me it's it's growing it's a, it's changing it's evolving it's becoming relevant to newer audiences in ways that it couldn't be relevant to us um so i mean it's 
just as a spectator of the franchise, mm. it's it's nice to see it grow and change and evolve. Yeah, and not to be cheesy about it, but you know, at, at risk of that, there are you know there there are young boys and girls now getting getting stuff out of it, aren't they? You yeah. know, who will fondly remember it and will be you know discussing it and reviewing it in decades to come. Yeah, and, and having their own fresh takes on it, you know. Yeah, well, once you've indoctrinated your nephew, as you were trying to do earlier, <laughs> he was trying to get him to say Star Trek. You can say Star, you can't say Trek yet. Yeah, I think we're you know we're, we're close. Yeah, well, maybe in like thirty years' time, Luca can do a podcast, and you can guest on his podcast and <laughs> shake your fist about the good old days of Star Trek. That is a future I am very happy with. <laughs> All good things. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you as well for joining me. I've really enjoyed uh, chatting about that with you. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. It's been not only nice to have the chat today, but since you proposed it to me, just to be texting each other about Star Trek pretty much every day. It's been fun, <laughs> it's hasn't been it? fun yeah. It's been fun, yeah. It's been, been a great discussion space, um, and I've really enjoyed revisiting some of those ideas with you and kind of kind of chatting about something that means a lot to both of us. So uh, yeah. thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you, listeners, and uh, we'll be back with another Escape Goat podcast uh, before too long. Thanks very much. Let's see how much you know. Here we see... A basic musical phrase in the major mode. I've done a preliminary study of the topic. Sing it for me. La 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 la... Seven. Has anyone ever told you you have a beautiful voice? It's a true gift. The gift is from the collective. A vocal subprocessor designed to facilitate the sonic interface with Borg transponders. Let's try something a little more challenging. You are my sunshine. It's a simple melody from Earth's 20th century, a good piece for beginners. Sing. The other night, dear, as I lay sleeping, I dreamed I held you in my arms. That was flawless but try putting a little more emotion into it like this when i awoke dear i was mistaken and i hung my head and cried see computer add instrumental accompaniment on to the chorus together now you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. You've been listening to the Escape Goat podcast, hosted by David Blake Fagiani. If you want to contact the podcast with any feedback or thoughts, you can leave comments on our Lipsyn page or under our YouTube videos, or email us at escapegoatpod at gmail.com. You can also reach the show on Twitter on at egoat underscore pod and follow us for new episode notifications or get me personally on at dbfagiani. This podcast is available on YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well as our Libsyn site escapegoatpodcast.libsyn.com. Original intro, outro and any other incidental music for this podcast is composed, produced and made available by permission of Richard Gilbert.